All right. What's so, going on, man? Let's get it. Stella, Stella come joining on. us. Come on, Stella. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode three of Loading with Will and Finn. We are very excited to welcome our host and guest at the same time. We're here in his <laughs> lovely estate in Park City, Utah, as you can see in the background. It's pretty gorgeous. We've got a uh, episode with a view for you guys today. In addition to Hunter Tiedemann, um, our guest last host, we're gonna have a new co-host, Stella Blue. Uh, this is a- uh, Yeah, this, this is, is uh, Finn's uh, dog. This is the dog. Um, and she'll be uh, helping us get to know a little bit about Hunter. Um, he's a, been a longtime friend of ours uh, since high school, so it's someone we know really well and have a lot of respect for. Um, but want to share him with you guys, and also just kind of joke around and tell some stories about our trip in Utah and our, our experience so far. Absolutely, we've known each other for a long time. We've been friends since like freshman or sophomore year of high school. We all went to Loyola High School together, um, and <laughs> Finn and I, Finn actually. <laughs> as a graduation present, just got like a new Mazda from his parents for uh, for his grad present. We're mobile. And uh, we were very much trying to put as many miles on the Mazda this summer as we could. So Utah was something that we definitely wanted to put on the horizon. And then our good friend Hunter caught wind of it and decided to have us up for a week. So thank you, sir. Of course, yeah. Glad to be here, guys. And uh, hello, everybody watching. Uh, but yeah, we've had about a week up here together playing golf, uh, we're gonna fish today, hiking, tons of uh, good stuff, some good meals as well. Oh, some yeah. pretty good enchiladas and Yeah, some salmon. enchiladas. This man made a souffle last night. Topped off by a souffle. We had a little colliding too, concussions have occurred. Yes, wow. yeah, that's that's gonna pull it's been, on Stella. It's been an exciting week, it's been a very exciting yeah. week. <laughs> we wanna start by kind of breaking down some things about Utah that we've noticed since being here. I've been coming up here for a long time um, we've been going up to Park City to snowboard. We usually go on like President's Day weekend or MLK weekend. Um, but I've never been up here during the summertime. And something that Finn and I both noticed almost immediately when we got here was like the Utah hospitality, how we kind of attribute like a general niceness to everybody here in the area. So talk a little bit about, about that and how, why your family's been coming up to Park City for so long. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the first time my parents came here actually was 2002, which was the uh, Winter Olympics here. Mm. And uh, awesome. at, the, at the time, my mom, um, it's kind of a cool story to tell. My mom worked for Wayne Gretzky, where uh, no she, was, yeah, so she was uh, Wayne's business manager for 20 years or what? so. so uh, that's badass. Yeah, so, that was really cool. I, I'll, I'll, that's a good story too, actually. So yeah. um, my parents meet the first day of business school at UCLA, mm -hmm. um, and then they graduated in 1980. 1980, I believe. Um, and my mom got recruited to work on the uh, 84 Olympics in LA no one. Um, after a couple years at Deloitte. And so she gets this call after the, the Olympics from a friend who says, hey, you know, the Kings just made this huge trade. Uh, there's some Canadian hockey star coming to Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen the news. Wayne Gretzky, yeah. yeah. But, the great uh, one? Yeah. yeah. Ever yeah. Heard of him? <laughs> um, and my mother had just done a, uh, uh, master's in business taxation at the time, and he needed to do transitional tax work in California. No way. Is almost synonymous with taxes. So, um, I still. <laughs> so she did a little contract work, and it turned into a twenty-year career with them. Wow! So That's pretty awesome. Two thousand two. We'll fast forward. Is the um, the Olympics? Wayne gets recruited to coach the Canadian hockey team, mm. and that finals uh, for the gold was probably the most epic game since the nineteen eighty. Uh, U.S. Lake Placid, since Lake Placid. Yeah. Um, but uh, so my dad, my mom and dad, they're sitting behind the glass watching this game and like, this place is awesome. This wow. is just such a cool area. The vibe at the time, the Olympics are just an out of body experience of what I've heard. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm so stoked to get to experience it. Like, that is so yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, because it's coming to LA. Yeah, like, it's coming to LA in 2024, 2024 I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yep. Um, so that was our first experience. Well, I guess I was only five, but so were you up here with us during that? Or? I don't think so. No, I don't remember much from those days. I would remember that game if I was there. <laughs> but um, for sure, bro. That was just an awesome experience. And they said, this place is really cool. It's on the up and up. It still is. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to, to have a place to kind of escape um, escape LA. But a lot of it was when my grandma passed, we needed a new place to, we because she would do, um, she would do holidays with us and stuff, and it just was not the same without her there. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of a way for us to uh, kind of uh, put 
put a new start a new chapter. We went from five Tiedemans, uh, sorry, six Tiedemans down to five. There aren't many of us, so mm. this was kind of a new place to start the next the uh, kind of the next um, That's really book cool, of memories, man. so to speak. Absolutely, so, man. Yeah. Hopefully, this is becomes a place for us to like you know reconvene and and be able to bring our families up here one day. You know. In the coming years, so that's yeah. really cool. Your parents to start that tradition. Mm -hmm. right here. That's the hope. I mean, we we got we we've got bunk beds for a reason. We hope we get, we get people <laughs> yeah. up here as much as we can. Hopefully, the first annual Park City trip. Yeah. Well, it's it's been beautiful, dude. And I like multiple times we just looked around and like, wow. Like, I mean, this yeah. view behind us. I'm sure the camera doesn't do it justice, but it's like I've yeah. never been up to Park City. These guys have both mm -hmm. been up a bunch. Uh, seem to know the area well, but for me, this is really like my first Utah experience. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, the drive up here past Vegas is when things start to get really beautiful for me. All of a sudden, the rocks start to get red, and you get a lot of crested buttes, you know? Absolutely. And it's just, like, stunning. And then turning the corner into Park City, it's a, it's a very different, way more piney, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, but we've gone on some hikes that would have been epic. We, we hiked up to this waterfall yesterday. Yeah, Stewart Falls um, by Provo, Utah, yeah. if, if you need any hiking recommendations in the area. That was pretty sweet. We're flirting with doing um, a river flood, so it's been just a kind of a like cool, <laughs> cool, uh, like a quarantine kind of getaway. Yeah, absolutely, man. After being locked down in LA for what four or five months now, um, it feels so good to be to be able to break out and come out to the mountains and be able to just you know reconnect with nature and stuff and kind of recentralize uh, what we're what you know kind of our headspace heading into work and maybe you can talk about that a little bit because you and Finn have both been uh, furloughed for a little bit from your initial offers. And maybe mm -hmm. you guys can kind of break down the, the stories of how that happened and maybe how you're coping with it and yeah. maybe how this trip has helped. Yeah, do you want to go first? Sure, I mean, um, I mean, I think I've mentioned this before, but I got pushed back from August to January, um, which at first I was pretty bummed about because you know, starting your post-grad career is, I think, at least for me, the way I feel about it is I kind of want to hit the ground running. You know, it's uh, it's easy to kind of get a, in a lull, if I feel like, after post-grad. Um, so I was kind of worried about it. Not to mention financially, it's like I wasn't planning on supporting myself an mm. extra four or five months, you know what I mean? And Stella as well. And Stella and my child. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> puppy food's expensive, y'all. Uh, but, I mean, so at first I was kind of a, a little bummed. Um, I was also like, I just, you know, this wasn't the market I think everyone was expecting to graduate into. Absolutely. So all of a sudden you're like, wow, what are the conditions going to be like when I do get to work? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, how is that going to change the way I do my job? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little bit of it. But then I had some older folks um, in my family kind of just sit me down and be like, hey, like, you're going to work for a very long time. Like, there's no rush mm -hmm. to get there, you know? You're gonna find that in ten years from now, those three months that I started working, in, or that I would have started working, and I, I now get free time, they would be insignificant. You know, mm -hmm. so I've really just been trying to soak up my free time, grow out my hair, um, <laughs> live freely. <laughs> um, but it's been a really incredible time. I got to reconnect with a lot of friends that I've been, you know, away working a lot of summers, mm -hmm. um, and they've been away working a lot of summers at wherever they go to school. Um, and it's been complicated. It's like it's people that I love to see that I haven't gotten to spend so much time with. But quarantine has kind of brought everyone back to LA, um, and everyone's got free time and is being very creative with how they spend it. So I've gotten to find some new passions that you know I didn't know I had. Uh, reconnect with some people that you know I love to spend time with. So it's been kind of a blessing in disguise for me to probably have this free time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm stoked to hit the ground running when I finally do get to work and just work as hard as I can. But you know. I'll take uh, I'll take whatever I'm given. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good way of thinking of it. How about you, Hunt? <laughs> take take what what you're given with the time. I mean, I oh yeah, he's the microphone. I, <laughs> I do. I I remember when, uh, when this whole thing started. I was getting emails mid February from the Career Center at Georgetown. I went to Georgetown, and I get these these uh, emails like, "Hey, it's the best job market we've ever seen for graduates." You know, there there are there's recruiting sessions next week. You know, make sure you get in before spring break. And um, I had already signed an offer back in November, but not even four weeks later, I think the S and P had lost something like twenty five percent. The unemployment claims were just skyrocketing, and I think just the the whole country was like, "What happened between case number one and just everything that's happened?" 
But um, I tried to think of it because um, I got that email over spring break that, hey, don't come back to campus. And I thought, well, yep, same dude. And I had just paid my last rent installment. I said, you know what? I'm just going to go back and have whatever semblance of a senior spring I can. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've tried to think of it, like you said, as a blessing in disguise. You know, we may look back on this and say, hey, you know what? I actually had four months to uh, find something new here. And so I emailed some professors and I said, hey, you know, I'm. <laughs> I suddenly got pushed back from July 13th to October 5th. Um, I'm still curious. Do you have stuff you can send me I can read? Is there something I can look at? Mm -hmm. You know, because um, a lot of the stuff that I studied, I'm super still interested in. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, just send me a reading list, whatever you got. What's going to be on your syllabus? Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that and I'm going to take the GMAT. But um, beyond that, like you said, just kind of slow down, reconnect. And mm -hmm. there's Absolutely. a little bit of guilt to that because a lot of the country is you know, where's my next meal going to come from? Totally. Where, you know, what's my next paycheck going to be? Yeah. But I'm trying to just kind of say, okay, you know, let's slow down for a bit. You've been going full speed since you were, you know, 15, but um, definitely reading a lot, taking a few shots off the golf game. But, um, <laughs> yes, no, definitely. I'm trying to find something that really interests you that you can come out of this as if almost like a, uh, like a caterpillar coming out as a butterfly, you know, mm -hmm. when this is all over, what can I, what, what, you know, tool can I pull out of my quiver that's going to help me, you know? Absolutely. Which actually, this brings me, and I want to make two points. One, you know, you bring up the guilt factor, like, that's a real thing, because, like, this isn't yeah. normal, but, like, we're also so blessed to, like, have jobs to still go to, you know right. what I mean? Exactly. Like, it could have very just as easily been, like, hey, you're not employed anymore, you know what I mean? And that would have just totally shaken things up, so that's a huge, huge blessing. But the other thing is, I think from, like, a recruiting standpoint, probably one of the biggest questions you're gonna get going into interviews is like, how did you, what did you learn during quarantine? Mm -hmm. like yeah. how, what's a skill that you've got yeah. during quarantine? Cause you have all of this free time. If I'm an employer, it may be an unfair expectation, but I want you to try to improve yourself. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. I want you to, you know, push the boundary a little bit. For instance, uh, our friend Drew is taking like an Excel class to try and build up his mm -hmm. Excel skills. Cause you know, that's definitely one of those things everybody throws on their resume and maybe like 25% of people can actually shred Excel. Exactly. You know yeah. what I mean? So, <laughs> I mean, it's on mine. Maybe uh, yeah. performance. But, uh, I'll endorse you, bro. Hey, endorse those, <laughs> endorse those skills. Actually, though, a random like recruiter came through on my LinkedIn the other day and endorsed like every single skill I had and we never met before. You never met yet. <laughs> so I was like, that's oh, funny. okay. <laughs> appreciate that, bro. Yeah, Good luck. Pre appreciate it, whoever, whoever that was. That's but, funny though. But I think it is going to be interesting. And like, I've definitely taken the approach this quarantine of like, the one thing I picked up is surfing. Like, I just really, <laughs> yeah. I've really enjoyed it. I mean, it's a lot less like, uh, like, you know, making me business savvy, like Excel or something like that. But I can't tell you how much uh, rewarding it's been just to find a new sport to be Absolutely. competitive and try to make progress on. Absolutely. Because it's been since high school that I actually competed, you know, mm. in sports. And I know that sounds weird, mm -hmm. but it's like I really miss going out and trying to get better at something every day. Mm -hmm. And like after it, I mean, I, I wipe out all the freaking time, but at least during my wipeouts, I'm like, oh, dang, if I had done that correctly, like, yeah. that's how I'll get better on the next one. Right. Speaking of putting yeah. miles on the Mazda, that trip out to Malibu every day, really, you're putting some, some <laughs> miles on it just by doing that. Yeah. So there you go. My county line spot is on hold. Uh, <laughs> I can't afford that gas bill. <laughs> I'm filling up like three times a week. 40 bucks every other day. And hey, luckily the gas is the cheapest it's ever been. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, the but, cheap gas. But hey, I'm talking about the note of competitiveness. You play club baseball, right? At Georgetown? Yeah. <laughs> so okay, that's something I've always thought was really cool because, as I said, for a lot of us, it's like, High school's over, your competitive like Dude. athletic career's oh over. Oh my god. And you don't realize how much you miss it, at least for me, until <laughs> I was like a junior in college. Yeah. And I was like, I miss caring about the outcome of a game. You know what I mean? I miss like more than just a fan. Yeah. I feel like everybody transfers that passion for, for sport into like betting at some yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> and and then for me at least, lost a bunch of money for totally. in college. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Or We're just actually, like building your own social circles, you know what I mean? Like you take all that energy and you put it elsewhere. Like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I would love to hear one: what drove you to join that club baseball team? Because I feel like that's a commitment I wasn't ready to make. You know what I mean? Like I did intramural soccer for my fraternity, but like would never have. Been that's like once a week. That's like no commitment. And I walked to the rec field. Like yeah. there's no traveling for. There's none of that. So like, oh, kind of feel me. I am saying clubs are. Worlds apart. Yeah, but let's, totally. let's hear about uh, club baseball. This was probably closer to I am than, than real club. Um, but 
But uh, I mean, how much of this can I get into as far as <laughs> to go off? To, to 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 chaos and anarchy. Dude, no, let's hear about, let's hear so, about the organization of the team. Okay, so so club baseball. Talk, talk so, politics. <laughs> you'd be surprised. Um, it's a well, I mean, it's a pretty political school. But in any case, uh, the the way the school was set up, all the social life was through the club. So my freshman fall, I joined club baseball because that was you know something mm -hmm. didn't require an application or anything like that. So I show up to the first practice, I'm expecting, you know, I, I got full like gear on, I got my bag, my hat, I, I bought a Georgetown hat because I'm like, I gotta make this team, this is important, sure. I gotta have a social life here. And I show up and um, it's a bunch of seniors who are just kind of wearing like regular basketball shorts and I, <laughs> I walk up and I'm like, yeah, you know, this, is this club baseball? And he goes, yeah, yeah, this is us. And I'm like, so where's coach? He goes, oh no, I'm, I'm coach. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> sick, nice. all right. Yeah. Um, we got trials today. He goes, yeah, you know, we're just going to throw and toss for a bit and, mm -hmm. and play some catch, hit some grounders. And um, I'm like, yeah, so, you know, when's our first game? He goes, oh, we don't play until, like, the next, you know, next spring. But we just like to mess around on Wednesday nights. And uh, we would, I would characterize that team, God bless them all. But it was, it was, more, of a, this was more of a drinking <laughs> team with a baseball problem <laughs> than it was the other way around. Dude, so, that's like every dad shirt for their, like, softball totally, team. Yeah. <laughs> drinking team with a baseball problem. Yeah, I mean, it, but we had so much fun. These guys are all wicked smart. I mean, of the guys that I, I played with, some are, a couple are in med school right now. A lot of them are on Wall Street and doing awesome. stuff. But this was kind of like a release on Wednesday night to just play catch for mm -hmm. a bit. That's awesome. But that's at perfect. the uh, end of each practice, we'd play ground ball game where everybody lines up at the shortstop, and we get the biggest guy. Like, this guy played D1 and transferred to Georgetown. Okay. And I don't think he made the team or something, but he would just hit Patriot missiles <laughs> on you. Right. And if you didn't field it correctly, you uh, you were out. So the last guy yeah. standing, seniors would get one mulligan per, per game. <laughs> but, uh, Senior rules. Uh, I'll tell you two. Two. Are you wearing things. a cup during this drill? Uh, no, 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 not a chance. <laughs> it's a turf field. That's tough to stay down on it, though. But um, I'll tell you two quick stories. The the one of them being, um, we had a saying on the team that you know you're a club baseball player when you're the guy who's like, ah, oh, you know, senior year if I had thrown out my shoulder, I'd be, I'd be getting drafted, I'd be in D one, all that stuff. Uncle Ricky would have gone pro. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Is that actually a big the... vibe on your club team? Like guys are like, oh, I'm so close to playing like real baseball, but uh, no, I mean it was more just like fun, fun banter. But there were a couple guys who were really good who could have played, and then just you know they didn't want to want to do the whole thing. But yeah. what we do is we finally get to the games. And uh, you go rent these vans out the night before, and we all pile in at eight o'clock, seven thirty on a, on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Half of us look like zombies, and uh, we drive halfway, you know, through Maryland or Virginia to play because there are no fields in DC to use. So we mm -hmm. play George Washington University, thirty miles away. Mm -hmm. So we're in rural Maryland or something, and we play a doubleheader, and we're, we're on the way there, and I'm like, you know, so who's who's starting today? Who's catching? And uh, this the ca the captain the sort of I guess the coach he goes yeah well you know it turns out O'Brien's still hungover he's not going to make it he's not starting <laughs> I said okay well that's there's our pitcher so we got to find another guy for that <laughs> um, and then he'd be like I'm so like Who, who's catching he goes well Jacob checked out of the hospital two hours ago so you're going to be catching today or something <laughs> so I go all right here we go I haven't caught since I was 16 but here we go um, so you play two games and we're driving back and everyone's just hungry and tired and everything so we we pick uh, a mcdonald's on the way back mm -hmm. and you see these two vans pull up and then probably 20 you know 21 year old uh boys walk out of these vans and i swear as you walk into the mcdonald's you just see the manager in the back and just the look just goes Oh, as you can see, like, <laughs> to lock the guys you know, to they're just like, dude, we're body this place. Like, <laughs> so we we'd have a lot of fun with that, and then of course every doubleheader is followed up by a party at night and all that stuff. Oh, but nice. It was a lot of fun though. It How was, many of those road trips do you think you guys would make? Like, what's the farthest school away that you played? Um, oh, I think James Madison University is pretty far. Yeah, oh, um, in Massachusetts. Oh, no, gosh. James U is in Virginia, I think. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it a oh, it starts with an S. It's in it's on the very Mascot, tip actually. of Maryland. Oh, what is it? Oh, it's Stetson. Like, I don't know. It might be. Maybe Stetson. I forget. It was it was a while ago. But in any case, three hour drive, stay in the hotel, like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. But um. So yeah, 
You bring up an interesting thing, though, and uh, Georgetown Jesuit, right? Jesuit, yeah. Jesuit school. Um, my girlfriend Claire went to a Jesuit school too, and it, her campus dynamic was similar in the sense that very club driven. Like, yeah. the way that you made friends and like found your group and kind of your niche was by joining clubs, mm -hmm. which I always admired and thought was really cool, but couldn't have been more different than the big state school experience I got at Alabama, yeah. which was far more Greek driven and being in like, uh, not so much clubs, but it like, I guess you could kind of call them clubs like financial groups and stuff like that, or just yeah. like major specific groups on campus, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like being in the real estate group, being in the, you know, like banking group. Mm -hmm. um, but Greek life was a very dominant, you know, mm -hmm. part of our social scene. Um, um, how, how, was Michigan, Michigan, how was Michigan? How was Michigan? Yeah. Or, uh, I mean, I think the cool part about Michigan is that you can navigate your way through either of those two routes pretty successfully. Like yeah. I have a lot of close friends that um, weren't in Greek life but um, are involved in, you know, business. Actually, I guess, I don't know if that's con considered Greek life, but like business fraternities or, you know, different sort of like trade clubs like that or consulting groups that all mm -hmm. have social aspects to them as well. And there's a lot of people that actually um, have like a foot in both, um, on, on both, yeah. you know, platforms where they're like involved in social fraternities and business fraternities and have like two separate social circles. Like I have a ton of friends that did that. Like um, it, it, I, I've always admired the Jesuit approach, though, because it's like more than just like clubs or activities. It's like service groups. Uh -huh. Like, I don't know if that's the same for you, but like uh, Claire was super into For Boston, which is like they would go once a week to go teach uh, kids from like inner city schools. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's like, that's so cool. And it was a very popular thing on campus. You know what I mean? Like everyone kind of had their own service group they reached into, yeah. which my freshman year, we had things available like that. But it wasn't something that you would go hang out with those people. No. It was more like if you were looking for a place to go find service in your own life, you'd do it. Right. But it didn't then extend itself into your social life. Yeah. For was, me, that was something that I actually like wanted to do at school. Um, was like because we went to Loyola High School, like Jesuit High School. Um, their motto is like men for others, and we had to take off a whole month of school our senior year. Maybe so we can cool. talk about this for a second. So cool. So yeah. for uh, a month of school our senior year, we do something called a senior service project, and for me. I was, um, I chose to be in like kind of a, um, underfunded Catholic school down in Hancock Park. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's off, it's off Vine and, um, in Melrose. And like, I was, I, <laughs> I was basically right by Finn's house and I was like teaching the sixth grade for a whole month. Like the lady, yeah, wow. the sixth grade teacher quit over Christmas break and we did this over the month of January and I was teaching the sixth grade for a whole month. Jeez. Um, but yeah. I feel like. What did you guys do for your projects? I think you quit mid-year, man. Like, goodness. Yeah, Unfunded, yeah, dude. I, these teachers don't get paid a lot, and uh, like, they put so up with a lot of I tough stuff. Uh, yeah, man. I don't yeah. know the circumstances of, of which, but it was like a huge responsibility placed on an 18-year-old kid. Yeah. 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 What were you up to, Juan? I was um, so at the time I was I was playing baseball still, and then I had um, an AP class that still met in the morning, so I had to be near school mm. uh, one in the morning then to come back after. So I was at St. Thomas the Apostle School, which is that's right next level, isn't it? Yeah, if you yeah. if you're late on a fastball at the at the field, you'll you'll put it in their yard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which, oh, um, it's the one that's literally right next behind it. Right yeah. yeah. Is it behind or just to the left of the baseball? Okay, field, gotcha. On the western yeah. side. Yeah. Which another like similar what you said is a um, uh, somewhat underfunded um, Catholic school right there on um, on Venice. But uh, as far as you know, the I guess the the vitality and the mission goes, I don't think I've ever seen a place that is more alive than that spot. That's beautiful. Um, That's good. Cause, and I, well, actually, this is interesting that you brought this up because I got to give this, the closing address at the Senior Service Project that, that year. Remember when we had that ceremony? Yeah, no, I do remember that, Hunter. Yeah. And I, wow. What I talked about was, Props, dude. you know, because I was playing baseball there, so... I could never read, so they wouldn't let me do those things. <laughs> <laughs> Still can't read. Um, oh, I'm, I'm saying BG, I'm 21, and I can't read. <laughs> Because um, I was playing baseball, we'd hit foul balls all the time, so you'd go get them. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, this is so funny. I've retrieved hundreds of baseballs here, but I've never actually met these people before. I've yeah. never actually mm -hmm. shaken their hands, heard their stories, you know, been in their classrooms. And I get to do that now. I'm not wearing my baseball uniform, but you know, I'm wearing a button-down shirt and slacks every day. And I'm mm -hmm. being asked to TA and coach and somewhat, you know, sort of mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and so. That experience, what I talked about was 
that sort of line between the baseball field and their playground was a lot more than a property line because a lot of these kids, right. half I think upwards of of half, like close to seventy seventy five percent of the families are on financial aid there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these kids they, they get dropped off, and then you know the dad the dad has his Pizza Hut uniform on. You know, and for me, like I grew up, Super I watched my dad. Yeah. You know leave at 5 30 in the morning in a suit to go to you know downtown LA mm -hmm. and my mom did the same after she dropped me off at school. Yeah. And you know it's a different it's a different world. But what I will say though is my third day this kid named Christian walks up to me and he goes, You're from Loyola, right? And I had a Loyola pull mm -hmm. and he goes, I want to go there. I want to be like you. Mm -hmm. And it's I so said, sweet it just breaks your heart. You're just like that's incredible. This like, kid has he doesn't even know my name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all he saw was the logo. And he thought that's that's important. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing that. And I'm sure he grows like up looking at the other side of that fence thinking that's an incredible school. Yeah, you know I can what I mean? On that's, that. I can yeah. speak on that too cuz one of my like my main takeaway from my experience as well like teaching the 6th grade like there are some students that were definitely like unmotivated like completely unmotivated to do school and I can I can even tell like from being involved with it for a month that it's like kind of hard to like light a fire under someone who you know maybe isn't like getting the same reinforcement of how like important education is mm -hmm. um, at their house, mm -hmm. uh, which which may or may not be the case I, I, don't, I don't really know, but um, what was cool for me was I had actually gotten accepted to Michigan while I was teaching there, and so a little bit of backstory is like I was planning to go to Indiana because I had gotten like a nice scholarship to go there, had gotten deferred from Michigan, and um, basically had was committed to go to Indiana for like over a month. And I even post I even posted on Instagram. Hey, uh, you remember those days when you posted the like <laughs> yeah, I'm officially was, committing to so yeah. dumb. I, I posted Insert like school a, logo and everyone's like I posted an announcement and then ended up meeting that announcement a couple <laughs> a couple of months later. You but, curved them. You got curved but, you. Uh, I you know, I got in Michigan and was able to like kind of share with them like my story of like how I'd set a goal of one. Michigan was my dream school by far um, and had kind of like achieved all these benchmarks and was able to prove to the kids that if they start right now, like where they're at in sixth grade and basically hustle and try and, you know, get, get themselves to where they want to be and set high goals. And they actually got to watch me, you know, my goals manifest, you know, by getting into Michigan while I was there, we had like a nice, like they threw a little surprise party for me, like oh, on my last that's day, so sweet. which that's is really sweet. cool. But, um, yeah, like that was like a really, really, really like impactful moment. And all the kids similarly afterwards, like three or four kids came up to me saying that, that like Loyola was their dream school, um, for these sixth graders. So I was really stoked to be able to have some sort of impact like that. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. yeah. What'd you do, Finn? So I went to a school as well. Um, it was not a Catholic school though. It was a pretty underfunded public school um, in like mid city LA. Um, and I worked primarily with little disabled kids, mm -hmm. um, which was a really unique challenge because I don't have any formal training in that. Right. Um, and it just requires a lot of patience. But one big takeaway I had was like, the infrastructure at this school was so not adequate. Mm. It was just like these kids needed way more help than me. You know what I mean? And everyone else that was looking after them was just volunteers, you know? Um, and that was something that I just kind of grappled with a lot because I was just like, I, you know, you work with these kids and you like you get close to them. You're like, oh God, I want to help you, but I don't know like if I'm enough. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like someone with years of training and that needs to be paid a lot of money, you know, because they've been going to school to work with this. Mm -hmm. um, is what they need, and I don't think the school is able to give that to them just on a financial level. So yeah. that was kind of just heartbreaking, understanding that people were in that situation where right. you know help probably isn't available to them that they could get. So that was just a very I think human lesson for me of just like you know feeling like I, I if life is gives me the opportunity financially, I'd love to give back and help mm -hmm. groups like that, but. You know, even if I'm not in a financial position to do that, like just take time. Donate like, your time. Yeah. yeah. I I, was, I did a group in Alabama called Al Al's Pals for a little bit, um, which is similar. It's like you just go and teach the inner city kids, mm -hmm. and it's crazy. You talk to them and they're like, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And they're like, "I don't know. I'll probably just work at like Papa John's or something like that." And that's crazy because to me, I never grew up thinking that. I was like in the hunter's shape where it's like my mom stayed at home and my dad, you know, put a suit on every morning and went to work. Mm -hmm. And like, there's, I didn't have that expectation. Like I knew that that was a job I could have in life if I didn't want to go have a suit job, but I have always thought a suit job was available. Mm -hmm. And these little kids don't 
have any idea because they can't want to be what they can't see. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, it's, it's tragic, dude. It's just like, and it requires mentors, you know, of people that are in a lot better positions to go yeah. and to be big brothers and big sisters and, you know, put on and really help these kids because, you know, it's, they're so capable and they're so brilliant, but a lot of them don't get good examples. And the other thing I saw a lot of was just really tough behavioral problems where kids would lash out and just get kind of aggressive as young kids mm -hmm. just because they were frustrated. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they were having trouble learning, you know, because maybe something was going on or it wasn't as easy for them or they just didn't have a place to go home and do homework. You know what I mean? Yeah. And instead of it being a really human problem where people are like, you know, we need to find another place for you to work where you can continue to work on your education. It's not like you just go home and all of a sudden you come home and you come to school the next day and you get yelled at for not doing your homework. You right. know, because now this kid just feels dumb mm -hmm. and made fun of and he's just going to take on another persona to get attention. You know, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of that. So, you know, it, it, it made me very close to the education system and also very close to uh, just how fragile children are, you mm -hmm. know, and how important and uh, it is to try to do your best to, you know, help kids out. But that service um, to me is one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. Just getting yeah. to immerse yourself in another community so different from your own was such a treat. And especially so, these days, something that is kind of like a more modern topic being talked about right now. Um, in terms of like a digital divide, um, sure. especially when um, we're, we're talking about um, canceling the fall semester on the whole uh, sure. for public schools in the United States, um, just as you know, general safety measures, the digital divide is gonna widen the education gap even yeah. more, um, especially these days with uh, you know with low accessibility to you know proper technology um, in lower socioeconomic um, households. And then of course, like, how are they gonna how are they gonna like you know make sure that those people don't get left behind? You know, I think it's tricky too because I'm like of two minds of this. One, I feel like digital like. Increased automation, like automation in learning, should create a better base ground. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There shouldn't be teachers don't get paid enough, kids don't get to learn base level everything. Right. You know what I mean? Just because that should be available. But the other problem is like you have monetization, which is like, what if you can afford the super duper program? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Where you have to pay five hundred dollars a month for it. Yeah. And like your kids are getting a much better education, and much likely to go to a better schools, and it's like. Mm -hmm. I guess it's the same problem with public-private, you know, right now, but it's just like, I don't know. It's the yeah. same logic um, for when, you know, with them wanting to do away with standardized testing like ACT and SAT, like they're not even, my, I don't even think my brother, my brother's a junior in high school right now, I don't even think he's going to take it um, because they're starting to do away with it now because, you know, I know for a fact that my score got boosted because I could, you know, afford to take a class that, you know, totally. help, would, you know, specifically taught me the things that are going to make me have a better score for, yeah. you know, four or five weeks. Of Here's the math class. tips you need. And, and guess what? Not right? everybody can afford that. So yeah. boom, there you go. You immediately, you can definitely like d pay for a better score just by nature of, you know, the, the classes available. So here's where technology benefits you though, is there's, I can think of two really good examples. One Khan Academy. Yeah. Yep. Um, Khan Academy has gotten me through probably eight years of schooling, like very sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was in Calc 3, I was like <laughs> Khan Academy and it did a better job teaching me my teacher in college because it was like, mm -hmm. he's a researcher. He didn't really care about how much we knew it, you know? Um, so Khan Academy, I think is a free public resource that if it is made available and made important to kids, you know what I mean? Like, hey, this right. is a great way to supplement your education. Phenomenal. Yeah. The other yeah, example is being used in like, um, schools. you know, struggling and developing countries right now as a form of free education. Because yes. um, I know Microsoft, Bill Gates put, his name is Sal Khan, the, the founder of Khan Academy. Um, he put him on for many millions of dollars to yes. help actually build out his platform. Um, and I know there's a huge Google education in initiative um, involving uh, Khan Academy on like these little iPads that yeah. are distributing around. So I think technology provides a phenomenal benchmark for, you know, free public education. Mm -hmm. And on the, the, the note of third world countries that you're talking about, there's also emerging startups that will do, it's, it's different than Khan Academy, but with the tech revolution becoming so important as, as it is, 
a lot of people are like, I want to learn to code. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's not yeah. a traditional schooling that we ever grew up with. No, I, I didn't take code. a coding class until college. No, um, absolutely. And I'm a, I'm a MIS major. You know what I mean? I'm an information right. guy like you are. Um, but a lot of these third world countries are seeing opportunities for um, for a lot of progress to be made in that. And startup, for example, will give them all this training for free. Mm -hmm. And then once they do get jobs, they'll get like 10% of their salary mm -hmm. until they pay back what it would cost for the course. Right. Which is also an interesting thing because it's it's really folk it's like more like a trade school in that regard. Right. You know what I mean? I know it's like pipelining work, which I'm a pretty big fan of. I do like that idea. I took a class that was really interesting that Hunter and I were talking about uh, yesterday on our hike. It was called uh, Global IT and Society. And mm -hmm. the TA that was in charge of the class was like a product of one like that government sponsored um, software programming education in pa Pakistan mm -hmm. and he was such a bright dude like so 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 smart. Sure. Mm -hmm. he like went to high school in Pakistan and then came and got his higher education here and is getting a master's at the School of Information um, super super interesting class that we can delve into um, later but what they're doing is they're is they're directly investing in their in in their own population to become like modernize their um, workforce, their workforce, and become like tech hubs. Sure. You know, because mm -hmm. you can hire. You there are d software development teams all around um, over there that you can you know third party hire to develop your your stuff, and it's it's cheap and they do a great job. It's yeah. cheap and also it's a different form of education because uh, I don't know for me at least it's like far more logic based than it is math or science based, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's way more about like training your own brain and being able to like input that on a computer. And there's a language element where you do learn how to write it, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think that's gonna be similar to any formal education we ever received as children. Yeah. You know, it's not bio class. <laughs> before, uh, before we get off that topic, I was, um, I was thinking too about the rest of that story about when I was, um, when I was giving that speech, because when I, I was talking about this there, that uh, that this kid Christian, mm -hmm. and I did not know this, but in the 500 people out here, sitting right in front of me was, was Father Goebbels, the president of right. Loyola. And afterward he came up to me and he said, you know, that kid Christian, that's the kind of kid we want here. That's, that, that is just, that is a phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, you know, engine right there mm -hmm. of a person that we want. And I believe Christian is there now because he told me when he applies. Oh, I, I, I love that. That'd be so here. freaking cool. Yeah. Did he hit you up? No, he's going to oil. I'm pretty sure he's still there. I I, I said that to the um, to the sort of uh, manager, uh, sort of um, admissions group. I can ask my brother. Uh, yeah, you should do that. Yeah. Like other, right? um, I, I, she's essentially the um, kind of director of the school. I said, you know, this is something I really hope happens. When mm -hmm. he's in sixth grade at the time, but. Um, but that's that, that's what I, I I still think about that though when we were talking about you know kind of volunteering and giving your, of yourself. Mm -hmm. you, who who else is doing that? What other school is having you take off a month in your senior year and say for the next three weeks, books, binders, pencils, forget it. Put your put your work clothes on and go find a place to give of yourself when sure. you're 18 years old. It is such a formative right. thing. And it's especially, especially because you're so malleable at that age. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's tough because I feel like when you go to college too, you really start to make up your own mind of things. Yeah. yeah. And if you only keep getting the same experience you've ever gotten in life, you're only going to be more sure of it. Yeah. The crazy yeah. part is, I feel like that is those that for senior year, the senior service project and the Kairos retreat. Obviously, yeah. anybody who's been on Kairos knows what I'm talking about. Um, some people call it Kairos. for if you haven't been on Kairos. Without devoting too much, it's basically it means time with God, and it's 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 not even a religious thing. I'm you know I've never been baptized or any of that. I'm not Catholic. Mm -hmm. This is a Catholic school, and it didn't matter at all. It's strictly you getting to know. For us, the people it, we had gone to high it's school, it's like a self discovery retreat. And you just it's just yeah. four days of just complete honesty, and it's just an incredible feeling because you're like, wow, the world is a very forgiving place, right. and everyone is um, more friendly. You know? If I may share this, um, Finn. Part of the reason Finn and I are as close as we are is because we were actually paired in the same Kairos group yeah, that um, I went on junior year. That, uh, that were you on the you same one? So I led your. Oh, we led. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so Jim and I were in the same group, um, and yeah, but uh, we got a little Kairos love triangle here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just—it's such a formative thing when you're 18 to start a habit of. Well, actually, we started earlier when, when we were freshmen because you had to do those hours 10, 25, 25 each year. Mm -hmm. 
but start that habit of, you know, I got what I need, but I can volunteer. You know, exactly. And, and like you said, it doesn't have to be financial. You know, we're we're here in in, uh, totally. in Utah, and um, uh, I'm I'm a Sigma Chi, and a lot of what our philanthropy does is um, we donate all of our proceeds to Huntsman Cancer Institute. Huntsman being the uh, it's a they're a huge uh, Utah family, uh, former governor, mm -hmm. uh, ambassador to China. And uh, they endowed this cancer research center. But what he always said to us, um, you know, in our, in our meetings and whatnot was, you know, we're all blessed to a certain degree in different areas. Some of us financially, and we can donate, like you said, mm -hmm. but others in other ways, whether it's your time or your insight, whatever it may be, because we understand what our side of the giving relationship is. You know, mm -hmm. I rather write a check, I teach a class, but you don't know what the other side of it is. You don't yeah. know what Christian feels when I play soccer with him after lunch and I, yeah. I listen to a story. And it probably means the world to him, bro. Yeah, so even if you feel personally like, oh, I, I didn't do much, I didn't move the needle, you did. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can vouch that when I sit up there in front of 300 classmates, knowing that those 80 hours they spent in the last three weeks, how many interactions like that you know, change someone's life a little bit. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not writing a big check or endowing a cancer institute, you don't know how the other end of that, of you just deciding, I'm gonna you know, say hi to this person or teach them something. You don't know what that's gonna feel like. For them. So, to that degree too, you can write a check. And it, money's hard to make efficient sometimes, I feel like, yeah. especially if there's a lot mm -hmm. of it. But I would say your one-on-one -on -one impact with Christian, if he's at little, it's like life changed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that guy, should be capable of anything. You he know what I mean? He could be on like, Kairos right now. He could be on yeah, Kairos right now. He, he could be looking forward to going to college next year. You know what I mean? Um, and it's like the, I mean, I think, and if, 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 if at least a little bit of that is from you mm -hmm. meeting him, being so impacted and telling his story to people that care enough to look after him right. in a couple years yeah. from then, it's hard for me to not count that as changing a life. You yeah. know? Also, the, the whole point of me bringing up um, the Kairos is like, I was trying to count trying to make this point about how Kairos and the Senior Service Project kind of serve as two like moments where you need to release your entire ego and yes. realize yeah. that you're not shit and you know what you do can impact the world, you know what I mean? Like Which especially um, going to work at schools the way that yeah. we did, like we made a direct impact on life at, at, the, at a bare minimum, the classroom that you worked in, yeah. like 40 kids. You know or the mean? volunteers that have just been, you know, super overstressed and overworked, you know, yeah, absolutely. and have a little bit of help and maybe like a little bit of like youthful, you know, bigger. Mm -hmm. But I, to put what you're saying though, it's so important to like, for me, me at least, to have had those experiences in high school, because high school you're so hyper ego. Mm -hmm. At least I absolutely. feel like I was. I absolutely. definitely feel like I was. <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> it's really. just like, it's just like you're, you're trying to matter, you know what uh -huh. I mean? And... All of a sudden, you get to drive cars for the first time, and you really start to identify a little bit of independence mm -hmm. and a social independence. Yeah. Where you're like, I want to matter. I want to be liked. I want, and you want so many things that just, yeah. it's like, you know, you know, it doesn't matter. You aren't shit. It doesn't matter. Yeah, be I'm, yourself. Calm and breathe, and it's gonna be fine. You know, on that like, point, gosh, you know, this is something that you're, what you were exactly talking about. Is Father Global is the president of the school talks about this that each student he thinks has an inflection point. Mm -hmm. In your first two years, like you said, you kind of go from a shy 14-year-old kid and now you're driving to school mm -hmm. and you're kind of, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm a yeah, big shot, absolutely. you know? College is on the horizon, you're right. thinking about you're it. Like, underclassmen. Receive, receive, receive. And then you get to varsity sports, AP classes, and retreats. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly turns, there's an inflection point. You go from receive, receive, receive to suddenly, oh, I have a lot to give. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you, that person that you are at 16, 17 is not the same thing that you were at 14, 15 when you walked in. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful thing because I, rem I can remember watching that happen as we were there. Nice. And it's just, it's such a, a wonderful thing. I, I really do treat Loyola as a, as a big fork in the road in my life. That, totally. I mean, I still call teachers to this day. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, a, a God-given place, I think. That's cool, man. And it's um, fun, too, because, yeah. I mean, this is part of the project we're working on with this podcast. We're just reaching out to a lot of people Absolutely. that we know. And seeing them, like, further have another inflection point, further grow into, like, right. all that they well, can Well, because there's a whole step in the yeah. process that we, unless we went to college together, we totally missed. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, there's no, I haven't seen anybody, reconnected with anybody from high school that I haven't seen since then that hasn't 
drastically changed since yeah. the last time I've seen that. Because all of a sudden you go from, I've got some stuff to give, to you're graduating college, you're giving for a living, bro. Like, Seriously. you know what I mean? And it's like people are maturing into like some pretty incredible things. Mm -hmm. I, it's been really, really fun. It's been really cool to watch, um, you know, how our class has developed over these four years and seeing where everybody's at and you know, some of the some of the big success stories across our class, hopefully we'll be able to highlight as many of them as possible mm -hmm. um, on epi future episode. But we got a couple guys in the NFL right now. We got guys that are trying to be pro golfers, guys that are musicians, guys, guys that, that are guys joining that are the actors. Catholic world, like fatherhood. Yeah, like we got guys priest, that are priests. Right? We got, uh, shout out to Noah Utley. He's Doctors, going, lawyers, Navy SEALs, like just all of the above, man. Oh like, man, we're gonna have a very, very wide diversity. Oh, as well, um, we gotta we gotta showcase our man's right oh, here. Yeah. Speaking author, of his Georgetown club published career, published author. Um, so yeah. you hold it. Took yeah, the, yeah. It's better in your hands. We want to hear all about your your story and mm -hmm. how you found this class and this professor and what ultimately led to um, what you're holding in your hand right now. Yeah, I'd I'd love to. This uh, maybe give a little, little give a little flash of, of what. So you're this is a uh, next gen leadership secret to success for future leaders and. Uh, Believe it or not, that's actually, this book took 10 months. This is the 10th title I've, I finally said really? I swear to All you. All right, what was the worst title you had had? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it was like, like the Millennial Guide to Leadership or something. Like that. <laughs> it was just, it was a We're not even millennials. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not a millennial, like we're not millennials. Dude, it says millennials in it, but. That's I, just a target, it, that's just a target. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a target. <laughs> hey, millennials. <laughs> I thought I was. Yeah, we can talk down about but, millennials too. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was literally highlighted in the, the, you know, the title with the brackets behind it on my computer for months, like placeholder. Yeah. Do not Lead publish. Lead switch. Work in title. Load yeah. in title. So uh, this whole story kind of goes back to, gosh, fall of 2017. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown, and um, I was not doing great there. It was a it was a tough place, a tough school, far from home. Mm -hmm. uh, the weather was different, and um, yeah, tough man. Yeah, well, let's, let's speak on that afterwards because yeah. I, I can relate. But uh, yeah, especially, but um, I was considering transferring, and uh, it was parents' weekend, so my parents were in town. And there are these lectures that they bring the parents out to, but they're all at the same time, which is ridiculous because you can't go to multiple right. of them. So <laughs> there was one about like uh, China and tech and, and intelligence community, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's one about entrepreneurship. And I was I was kind of into the China thing. My dad goes, let's let's just try entrepreneurship. Yeah. Let's check that one out. If we don't like it, we'll walk out. Mm -hmm. I walked out of that room an hour later, like okay. Something's different. That's cool. This is this is my comeback story. This is how I'm going to turn Georgetown around for me. Good for you, so, man. Sounds good. I sit down, and Professor Eric Custer is standing up there, and he, Professor is not the word that would come to mind. He's got kind of long, spiky hair. He's got um, like you know, so he's sick. Very sounds trendy, like a cool, <laughs> like trendy clothes on, and um, and we're just kind of sitting there, and he starts talking about uh, credibility. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the new version of credibility is not uh, an MBA or a, a law school thing. It's showing what you're passionate about and having a product that will signify that on your resume, essentially. Mm, I like so that idea. What he does is he did all this research on, um, on um, like uh, successful people, so uh, CEOs, military officers, politicians, and whatnot. And what he found was of these people have what he calls a creation myth which is a six to 12 month project that is difficult, it is demanding, it's long term, it requires uh, some fortitude and some kind of grit component to it. Some giving of yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so Professor Custer is a uh, professor of, uh, of entrepreneurship. So he teaches classic you know, entrepreneurship 101. Here's your idea, funding, marketing, all that stuff. Turns out after three years, uh, only like three kids had actually gone into entrepreneurship. So he said to Georgetown, you know, look, this has been great, but I'm going to go start another company. He's an entrepreneur, a lawyer, mm -hmm. does a lot of stuff. But uh, I'll give you one more semester so you can find somebody. And I said, I get it, no problem, but, you know, have some fun with it, you know? Yeah. Let's see what happens. So he says, all right, well, let's try some creation event thing. Then. If we can't have these kids start companies, let's have them start a creation event. And the best one he thought of was a book. Mm -hmm. So I love that idea, dude. That is so... I, I don't want to. I don't want to say too much, but I think that is so intelligent because forcing kids to create companies, it's like you can't f force genius. You know what I mean? You yeah, can't right. force passion. You can't force. And I've seen yeah. a lot of 
Every, I, I know a lot of schools where kids do it. Like I'm, I'm heading the startup, which is phenomenal that that passion's in there. But it's like, is that, is that the idea? You know, like a book might be a Stella. Like Stella's trying to read it. Stella, <laughs> Stella, are you interested? <laughs> Um, but I think a book is so much more tangible and yeah, everyone's right. got an opinion. You know yeah. what I mean? Everyone's got that. Sorry, continue. Mm -hmm. No, 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 you're good. You're exactly right. You cannot teach passion. And that that's why, so um, so this class, he, he walks in the first day. Uh, I was the second cohort uh, to go through this, but he nice. walks in the first day. There are 25 kids in the class and they all do an entrepreneurship one on one syllabus. And he goes, uh, give me that. This is the, the syllabus to launching the venture. Mm -hmm. And they kind of start flipping through them. And the last page it says, you're going to publish a 30,000 word book by December of this year. <laughs> so did you know that going into it? Were you like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah, well, at that moment, 13 kids stood up and walked out. They're like, yeah. this guy's batshit crazy. Right. There's no way that's happening. How many, people, how many people actually stuck through it? 12 yeah. stuck through it. 12 out of 25? 12 out of 25. And it I love 10, that. Less that's than awesome. 50. That's, that's crazy. Awesome. 10 published. That tripled the number of college authors in the United States that year. What? Fast forward Ten to now. Got published? Yeah. So there were only three? Yeah. Yeah. Fast what? forward to now. There have been over <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Can we can we backtrack to that? Yeah. Three. So college, three authors, college authors total in the year twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Think now. about it, dude. Most then, college students were... that even get close to that are probably helping on a research team and they're not the co-co author. They're like maybe like a co 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 author. But... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So if you take that, blogs don't count. Looking at you, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Shot. Uh, but it's similar to what you guys are doing. This this is a creation event. This is a months long ordeal where you got to set time aside, research, find people. Uh, I'm sure this come there's comes a day when you say, God, why am I doing this? Yeah, I am. Yeah. At the time, I was talk about those days. Did you? What, what was your Stop. first one of those days, <laughs> dude? I so what I did for this book is so I'm sorry. The, the book is about leadership. It's about. Um, leadership development amongst college age kids, high school kids, because I felt like we never really asked that question enough of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us should graduate and get the keys to anything. We're, we're not smart enough yet. Yeah. But we should think about, okay, what, what does good leadership look like though? That's a question you can always yeah. ask yourself, regardless of where you are in the chain of command or the- uh, the, or the younger you ask that question, probably the better you'll be when it's time for you to take yeah, real leadership, right? right? So what I did was I found people who would just chat with me on the phone who are sort of towards the end of their careers and I would say, what can you teach me? What, mm -hmm. what can I compile for someone my age? So I found everybody from uh, CEOs, Marine Corps officers, entrepreneurs, uh, leadership coaches, uh, kind of gurus. Um, uh, I interviewed uh, some, some professional sports team owners. Mm -hmm. And I always ask, is there anyone else you recommend I speak to? And that would just kind of create a tree of people to talk yeah, nice. to. Um, but one of them being this leadership coach who, before each interview, I spend an hour going through their LinkedIn, their publication, yeah. read the intro to their book, all that stuff. And he just, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but just thought I was totally unprepared, did not want to be on the phone. Like mm -hmm. He was driving somewhere and was like, get me off this. Yeah, I'm doing this as a favor to somebody. Yeah. And That's so this bad. was the first one I did. And I, and I hung up the phone, I called my dad, I was like, this is an awful idea, I'm not doing this. This is not gonna go well. I have another one in two hours, dude, this is not going well. Mm -hmm. And he said, just just try it yeah. out, keep it going, this this is part of the process. Because you definitely, there's mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. You go, who, totally. who am I telling to lead something like this, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm not Stephen Covey. I'm, I'm, I'm in an entrepreneur but class. This yeah. is, hey, you're I'm touching on something that we were talking about that last night at dinner that I think is a really good tie into what you're talking about, is like, anytime you get those butterflies, you know, like the, yes. that tingly sensation, yes. you know you're doing something right, because yeah. what's coming right next is a big, big step forward in your own personal yeah. growth. And all yeah. on our podcast, what we're trying to, promote is just trying to become better as a person. Yep. Yeah. And so those moments right there where you're, you have a, sh a shitty first interview, you know, like you call your dad, you think you, you, you don't have what it takes to, to be able to interview these big shots and get, yeah. derive anything out of it. And you know, what, what came next? You, yeah. You, you stepped on the gas pedal, right? It's a, it's a, it's a good lesson. I, it's, you have, I think having that experience of, okay, I just got kicked in the teeth. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. I've already got a couple chapters done. I got a whole couple months. I, I have to get a manuscript done to the publisher by May 12th. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? And it, you just, you kind of go, all right, I can take a bad day. 
I there there are I can tolerate something not going according to plan, and I yeah. can keep going. Mm. And when I publish this thing and I take it out of the out of the box, I'm gonna think back to the day when no one saw me in the library. You know, I was up till three a.m. Whatever. But I can fall back on that day and know that when I start my job in January, I can have a bad day mm -hmm. where things just don't go well and I can suck it up and I can push on. That is such a helpful thing. And that's why I think creation events are just so important because you develop that, okay, yeah, this is hard. This is tough work, mm -hmm. but there's no reason I can't do it. It's, it's like Christian. It's the same thing. It's, yeah. this is tough, but you know, success is formed by habits. And, and if you can create the habit of, I'm still going to get 300 words done today. Even if I have a bad interview and a guy cusses me out or whatever, I can put a thousand words in on this book and get a thousand words closer today. Mm -hmm. Even if that happens. Yeah. I think that uh, touches on such a important lesson that can be really easy to miss out on. And it's that risk and reward are directly, you know, correlated. Mm -hmm. It's you're always going to have more risk if you want more reward. And mm -hmm. it can be really easy at first to feel lost in any way. And now risk can form in like any sort of loss. It doesn't have to be like, it's all over, this this opportunity to scrap, it's done. It can just be the little losses like, oh my God, that was a terrible phone call. Yeah. I feel like an imposter, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I think the lesson where it takes you is like, if you're able to see that goal to the end, it gives you the confidence, one, to be okay with failure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay, I don't need to win all of yeah. the time for me to not, for me to still get what I was working for. Mm -hmm. And the other thing it makes you comfortable with is like, having goals, you know what I mean? And outlining them, setting those forward for you. Like, yeah. I think that's an incredible lesson. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and because what happened was those first couple bad ones, I realized what not to do when interviewing, interviewing someone, especially totally. someone who could right. be under NDA or has a business, such that I learned, okay, this question, if I ask it properly, gets really good results. So when I called up a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton, yeah. I got a badass interview out of them because yeah. I failed three times before mm -hmm. and I knew what to do when something went south mm -hmm. and I got a great interview out of them and then I got to talk to the the former owner of the Kings awesome. and that I knew what to ask because I'd messed up before. Yeah, and also just, you're nailing you know, the big ones because right. you fluffed on the little ones. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's, and that's another idea of imposter syndrome which is like, you probably weren't imposter those first couple ones. Not because you were ever feigning to know about leadership because you didn't know how to interview, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. But all of a sudden you're no longer an imposter when you've got the interview down, you know yeah, what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're able to really extract Definitely. good information from the people you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And people respect people who are who are putting themselves to something in a creation mm -hmm. event. They admire the kind of hustle it takes to start Absolutely. a podcast or a yeah. book. You know, they know that you're not going to bed on time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I can remember- Well, I don't care, Brian, bro. You don't know how long it takes YouTube to upload this. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but I can remember having nights, I would sit in the business squad, my own little spot there, consistently, two, three o'clock in the morning, uh, proofreading my own book. You know, yeah. just like, I like this. This mm -hmm. is my, if everything else sucks right here, if I want to be, if I'm homesick, I got this thing. I got a little project mm -hmm. here. It's your baby. I'm you know? Yeah. Right. Um, but one experience, and I published it November 28th, 2018. We sold about 400 copies or so, 450. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Here's something, yeah. I, here's something I wanna say. So when uh, Hunter's birthday is, Hunter's much older than all of our friend group just because his birthday is like a July birthday. He's yeah, just turned 23. Happy mm -hmm. birthday to Hunter. He, so he had just like had a bunch of copies of his book last summer and gave it to me. And I read it and I was like, dude, this is a perfect book for like all little kids to read. Because totally. number one, he uses a lot of stories from base from being yeah. back in the baseball team, talking about some legendary teachers back at Loyola back in the day. Um, and I know for a fact that the new Dean of Men is our good friend's dad, Keith yep. Utley. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to Mr. Utley. If awesome. You're watching this. Um, awesome. Real little little, piece, yeah, little piece on him. Like I, I personally owe a huge debt to Mr. Utley. Um, because when my family decided to um, send me to school oil, I was living down in Newport Beach and the only way that I was able to do so was being car carpooling with him and Noah um, up to school every day. So he basically took me to school every day for the first year of school before my family could move up to LA and I could some, you know, take the metro or something. You know, and uh, since all my brothers have been able to go to school there, so started a great tradition for us. We owe a lot to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully he'll be able to influence uh, eventually pulling the trigger on getting this book 
um, on the reading list for some of the yeah. How cool would that be? I've gone back to speak That'd with be awesome. several times. You yeah. have? I spoke to the baseball team twice and uh, what? and the, the leadership class there. It was a Loyola um, Jesuit leadership class there as well. Dude, yeah. we, we need to get this book on the reading That's list. Awesome. That's awesome. That's so cool. Because that. That's there's so a video so, link yeah. we can put in the comments. Yeah, a video yeah. link for what? Do so when, I, when I spoke uh, to the baseball team. All right, yeah. we're going to drop a purchase link. Do you have an Amazon purchase link too? Uh, yes. All right, we're going to drop that, and we're going to drop the video of his speech on the YouTube comments mm -hmm. too. Yeah, but the what, what thing I always come back to with this is, and I'll get to the cover right in one sec because there's a cool story to that. But, you know, like you said, I'm 23, you're 22. Roll the dice. No. Like, we're going to, you know, we live till we're 80 or 90. Roll the dice. Yeah. Like, like if I'm 85 in a rocking chair, if I failed writing a book when I was 23, so what? I learned something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we really should not think of safety as the ultimate goal. And hopefully that's not your biggest yeah. failure at 83. Perhaps now. Hopefully you risk more. Yeah. But know? dude, I would not consider this book a failure at all. No, 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 no that's no, what I'm no. saying. You'd say, I had you failed oh, at 23. Oh, yeah. I should, I should. Those back at 81. I was like, dude, that's a really good book you wrote. Had it not turned out well, you know? Yeah. But I mean, I should. I should rephrase. We shouldn't safety should somewhat be a priority in a pandemic, but <laughs> yeah. as far as like your, your career advice. or life goes, take some risks. Yeah. Like, like yeah, write a book. Mm -hmm. Like, why not? Buy the ticket, take the ride. Yeah, why should I I, I can sit here wondering if I can do that or I can just go try it, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. just kind of pin you know, pin my uh my uh, uniform on and go for it, you know? Right. Um but uh the cover art on this talk about the cover art. So I mentioned earlier that we went from six to five little, 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 little. So there are Van, Dana White or whatever her name is Dana White. Oh, oh yeah. the chick that holds things. That's me. <laughs> so there are five planes on the front of this. Um, there are five folks in my family who passed before I was born. Um, my um, my grandmother, who I mentioned pa uh, earlier, had passed. Was the only one of my grandparents I met. So mom, my. Mom's dad, dad's parents, and then my dad's sister I've never met. Mm -hmm. So um, the funny thing linking all of them, though, and besides me and my family, is they were all in aerospace. My, uh, my aunt was the first female spokeswoman for NASA. So she would, wow, yeah, cool. she would come on the that's radio awesome. back in, during the Enterprise missions and announce what was happening. What? So they would take a, a, what's called a lifting body, which is essentially a um, space shuttle, but without engines, it's just... Uh, a practice thing on top of the 747, take it up to 50,000 feet, drop it, and they would practice landing. And she would kind of commentate like the, like a Vince Scully sort of thing. Hey, you know, they're banking left. They're going to put the flaps down now. That kind of stuff on the that's radio. Wild. So my that's dad's so driving cool. to work. The in-game announcer? My dad's like, holy crap, that's that's Trudy on the, on the radio. She's she's announcing the lifting body coming off the 747. Um, and your dad was listening to it? Yeah, he's, he's on his way to his job. He's like, oh my god, this is sick. <laughs> so, um, so that's one of them. Um, my mom's uh, dad, um, Jess Hunter, so that's, I'm Hunter Tiedemann, and he's Jess Hunter. Uh, we wanted to keep the name, so they gave it to me. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, uh, he was a pilot in World War II. He flew uh, B-17s. Uh, I actually found his logbook last year, missions in... Um, that he flew over southern Germany, mm -hmm. and there's there's I think nine of them. I think the fourth one in he got shot down over Allied. Uh, thank God Allied um, Allied France, and then he flew again two days later. Like they what? put a new engine on the plane. Back in you go. He got shot down and then flew two days later. Yes. Wow. He ended. Up, he was shot down twice, and it turns out that um, at his funeral uh, when he passed, my my grandma, they, they were going to mention that he was shot down twice, and she goes. Well, don't do that. You're going to make him sound like he was a bad pilot. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but just a really upstanding guy. Because um, I get all these things, these stories from my parents. So I want to put them in there somehow. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was always fond of saying, there's nothing you can't do. I don't care what you're doing. What you're, is this, this was a time, you know, back in the 70s, my, my, so my, uh, my mom and sister being raised that, you know, the opportunities for women were not the same as they are now. And so sure. he was very fond of saying, I don't care what happens. You get shot down, whatever, you know. Yeah. You, you can go to college, you can graduate, get a job, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then my uh, dad's dad, similar story, B-17 tail gunner. Same unit, actually. Different bomber group, but same unit in, uh, That's in Europe. That's crazy. Both World War II? Both World War II. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, so they're out there together. So planes, yeah. planes are like very deeply embedded. Yeah, in so the, the planes right? are, are a big deal, and so the five planes flying in formation are kind of coming together to symbolize leadership. Is yeah, so those look those listening on a Spotify. It's like an arrow shape. Yeah, with um, five paper airplanes in like a in like a flying V formation. Yeah, so they're coming together to symbolize the leadership aspect. So those mm -hmm. five people are uh, are those folks, and it turns out actually. So when I published this book. Uh, I had sent my parents probably 16 versions of it over time as mm -hmm. it went through iterations, but I always left the dedication out because they didn't know that they were going to have the dedication here. Mm -hmm. That's uh, awesome. You want to read it? Yeah. So it's longer than what a lot of books will get their dedication, but uh, the first part is those five people for Nomi, Jess Hunter, Trudy, Doris, and Alfred Floyd Tiedemann, the best leaders I have known yet never met. I carry your names with honor, respect, responsibility, and gratitude. For Evan, Lori, and Bob Tiedemann, the best expressions of lead by example. Wow, nice. so that's they had very never, well written. They had never seen that. Impactful stuff. And yeah. my, that, that my brought a tear to the eye, huh? Mom cried, Dad was millimeters away. Oh, sure. come on, Bob. I, after 12 months of writing, you couldn't get me more than tear. No, that was you. But, um, <laughs> he's got a mustache, though. He's got a, he's got a persona to uh, uh, oh, yeah. protect. But you know, it's another it's another aspect of we have a small family and we want something to kind of tie us together as it continues to grow, yeah. grow back to where it was, you know, before. Uh, we got visited by some bad news, but it's just, uh, it's a really special gift that I like to keep around and all of, uh, I sign copies for friends and whatnot. And, Absolutely, yeah, you sign but, um, me. Yeah, but uh, it's just, um, it's something that I hope a lot of people do and it's actually a pilot program now, so it's happening at right. these universities. And uh, awesome. you've, you've yeah. inspired some friend, for some close friends of ours in order to, to enroll in the exact same program. Yeah. Like if you don't have to go to Georgetown to, to be involved, right? Is nope. It, um, it's your a, degree has its own kind of pilot program? They do, yeah. It's been licensed out to different universities and there are clubs starting it and then yeah. even young professionals. Uh, it's really inspiring. I've actually had, is it three? I've had three fraternity brothers now publish, and uh, Brandon, our friend, is in the class. But uh, it's just, it's a really cool experience. It's something that I, I really look back on a lot of gratitude, mm -hmm. a lot of late nights. But yeah, gosh, what a fun thing to do, though. Um, you've you've referred to it a couple times, and uh, I want to open up a new conversation about mm -hmm. your experience at Georgetown, which I think was uh, another part of your your turning point in your journey is that you helped found a Sigma Chi chapter there. Yeah. Um, because your dad was a Sigma Chi at UCLA? UCLA. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. um, my dad similarly um, was a founding father of the, the DTD chapter at um, at University of San Diego and he likes to say that all the time. So uh, I want, he takes a lot of pride in starting the chapter there, and I'm yeah. sure you do too. So I want you to kind of walk us through what made you decide to do that, and yeah. you know how how it ended up going. It was a really funny occurrence. I was midway through this book about leadership, and uh, a friend of mine mentioned that he knew some sophomores. I was a, I'm sorry, some freshmen out of the sophomores, some younger kids who were starting this Sigma Chi chapter, and. Um, I thought, oh, that's interesting, but I'm probably overstretched at the time. I'm writing a book right. for Christ's sakes. I shouldn't be adding to mm -hmm. my plate right now. But um, it was something I wanted to get into. I, I hadn't had any success rushing for training so far. There's only two of my Georgetown at the time. But um, it just... It Slim pickings. Yeah, it didn't work <laughs> yeah, out. But, and, and I don't hold, hold any grudges about it. It, it, and it. it just didn't work out and it wasn't yeah. a good fit. So you know, we, you, life goes on, you move on. I, I found a book I wanted to write. So um, leadership uh, was a big aspect for me and just something I wanted to learn about. And Sigma Chi is a leadership development fraternity. That's really a lot of what it's structured around. It's to create, we, we call it values-based leaders. That's what all of our, all of our, um, our pledgeship, our training initiation is all about that goal. Mm -hmm. And I knew my dad was a sick, but I, I didn't know much about this at all. I, I just knew as a fraternity, which at, at the time I associated with just being social and you guys drinking on Saturdays and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, I thought, you know, it's 15 bucks to sign the petition to get a colony going. Let's just roll the dice and see what happens. Um, and it just progressed further and further. Um, and uh, we got to a point where we actually had a chance to really install another chapter at the fraternity at Georgetown. And they've been wanting to do this for a while because um, the province has chapters all around uh, D.C., but none actually at Georgetown mm -hmm. because they don't allow them. Mm -hmm. But you can do it, just not associated with the university. Yeah. So like when we go to table, we just can't be Georgetown University. Yeah. You know. Right. It's it's just. But you're still that Alpha Beta chapter. Yeah, we're still right? a new Beta chapter, yeah. but it's it's a different thing. 
But um, my pledging experience was five weeks and probably the most formative five weeks since Loyola, I would mm -hmm. say. So what's a pledging process like without older brothers? I'm curious about that. Yeah, it was such a weird thing. Um, so your McEuster runs your pledge class. So McEuster is- What? What is that word? <laughs> McGeester, McGeester, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> McGeester is Latin for master, which this is where the pledge master thing comes into play because like, people think it's... Ooh, that's but, a bad word. But, <laughs> you know, what, it, what it comes from is you're the master of the material. So you have, um, it's called your Norman Shield, which is the guidebook. So it takes you through our seven founders, our history, uh, the meaning of all of our, um, our insignia and our badges and our pins and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but the funny thing was... So our McEaster was a guy from an initiated guy from another chapter who was at Georgetown in a fifth year program. Okay. I was the assistant McEaster because he needed help. This is such a funny word. But, <laughs> well, you assistant know, to the McEaster. <laughs> Regional so, McEaster. But the funny thing, so, but, but I was not initiated. I didn't know anything. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't know what initiation looks like. Sure. So I'm like, how am I supposed to help? I'm like, I, I, I can't do anything. Dude. But speaking of the funny I'll name, be available. Though, is when you're not in a meeting, you can kind of colloquially, we would, you know, you, because, uh, uh, I mean, punch ups all, all pretty much public, but, yeah. um, like, if you see the McEaster, you're supposed to, you know, show respect. Like, this is, you know, this is a person who's spending their time to help me learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but if it was more colloquial, you could say, this is Bro Max. But if you see the system McEaster, it was Ass Max. So, I, I'd be in the, I'd be in the, uh, in the quad, and someone would go, Hey, ass mag, what's up, dude? Say, so you're, you're the ass mag? Yeah, ass mag like, is the assistant of McEaster. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be chatting with These someone. These Sigma Chi names are out of, out of control. Yeah, I'd be we chatting hear from other Sigma Chi's if ass mags is actually you. It was really funny. I mean, I'd be chatting with, like, God, like, oh, Jesus, who was a girl I was chatting with, like, they called <laughs> ass mags. Like, oh, this kid's just, just blow this kid's just, Yeah, blow your spot, walk out, try again um, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, it was a really, a really awesome experience though. You know, you, you're the, uh, I was always curious what made my dad the way he is, just a very upstanding, mm -hmm. you know, honor driven guy. And then I read that Norman Shield, I was like, oh, I get it now. You know, and, and it's all public, you can read it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a, there's nothing secret in there. Yeah. But um, what a, what a special organization it is. You know, I have a lot of mentors now. I mean, one of my closest mentors was an Air Force Colonel. He flew, uh, he flew missions in, uh, he was deployed, I believe, to, he's, he's older and retired now, but he still works at the Pentagon, but just such a, a just a really impressive An all-American badass? Yeah. That's what he sounds like. That's Jeez, pretty cool. Man. So, um, you seem very well connected, like, within the military and stuff like that. Is that, would you say that's true? Yeah, I, um, it, it's, I, so I studied for, uh, uh sort of international relations at Georgetown, so I was, is that, was, was, was that what your degree was in, international relations? I was a double major, I was Gov and, and IR, yeah, okay. or government, but I'm sorry, Econ and Gov focused on IR, gotcha. apologies, but, um, yeah, I, I had a lot of mentors in, um, who had worked in the State Department or, or intelligence mm -hmm. or the military, and, uh, you know, I, I had two grandfathers who served in, um, my girlfriend's in the military. Like it's a, it's it's just a, it's a really um, there there's a there's a class of people who volunteer to go do that stuff mm -hmm. and and take time away from what they want their career to be or if they want to be career officers, but right. or their just, families, and yeah, their families, families especially. Life, I mean, you know, a civilian life. It is a difficult thing, and it's just always something that's that's a, that's a fascinating. Me actually, two of so Sid Mackay was founded in eighteen uh, goodness eighteen fifty five. Ten years later, I'm sorry, six years later. Fact maybe, check that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> June 28th, 1855. The Whoa. We'll get the McGeester on. Let's call it the McGeester. I was the McGeester. Right. <laughs> I was the McGeester to the class behind me, so I didn't know all this stuff very well. But nice. Um, <laughs> two, three of our founders. So uh, one was a Civil War general, and he still uh, rests in uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. We go visit him nice. every year. We lay flowers at his grave site. What was his name? Uh, that is uh, Benjamin Pyatt Runkle is his name. Mm. He was a uh, general Civil War. Um, he was wounded and he was left for dead on the battlefield and he was rescued. And it turns out actually that one of his classmates at, at uh, Miami, Ohio, uh, penned a note to him in his honor. And they, these guys have been bitter rivals throughout college. Mm. And uh, he said, what an upstanding guy. I'm so sad to hear that he passed, essentially. Mm. And it turned out this guy lived and continued on. But um, That's cool. 
Yeah, a lot. Of the, I think of the seven founders. Classic Willie Nelson situation. I think he's <laughs> dead, but it's forget he's not. Or Kim um, Jong Un. Yeah. But, we already uh, talked about that. So <laughs> one. Still, still true. <laughs> but um, no, I've just found so many, uh, so many just wonderful mentors and great lessons throughout uh, throughout Sigma Chi, and then my initiation as well. Just probably the most moving experience in my life. Like just that and Kairos, I count as like yeah points in time where you're like, there's nowhere else around to be right now. Just I feel so yeah. in touch with That's fast, what it means bro. to be a good person right now that I just, what a beautiful experience. But um, That's awesome, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Still, are you getting tired over there? Still, things were boring. <laughs> yeah, so... She um, got tired of that book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to kind of backtrack um, because you were touching on um, some like sophomore year lows and I can totally relate to what you're talking mm-hmm. about and I think it's... Um, kind of important to, because my butt, my brother Rand's, um, did brother, I hear that right? <laughs> his butt, yeah. Uh, my brother Rand's brother <laughs> reached out to me because he wants to go to Michigan, uh, or his his friend reached out we, to me. We recently. get it, we get it. Got it? All right. Um, reached out to me recently because Michigan's a top school of his, and he had some questions, like, and for some reason, like, the weather was something, like, I didn't really consider at all. Uh, before going to school, I, I always just figured since I'm classic, I totally feel you. It's just by growing up in LA, you don't grow up thinking about the weather. No, yeah, no, ever. No. It's just that, like eh, that, that was the first thing that was weird. For if me. I wear it's shorts not, today, it's, it's cold. Check the not weather that on a regular cool. basis was was the first weird part of yeah. the, of living in the Midwest. And then the second weird part was what I didn't realize for me was worse than the actual cold. I didn't really mind the cold, but dude, like the gray, dude, yeah. like it just. Uh, I remember specifically sophomore year, like I was like one of the lower points of school because it had been like two months straight with no sun, sun. Yeah, like, and I was I was like white as a ghost, uh, and I was just vitamin like, D, <laughs> yeah, like, no vitamin D depression for like two running months. high. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if you kind of like if you attribute any truth to that. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that that's a reason to not go to any. East Coast or, or Midwest or cold weather school, I would say in general, it's just something to be aware of uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I went to Georgetown, so I started in August 2016, and you kind of know what happened three months later. But the yeah, city essentially blew up. Like, geez, yeah. Trump, I was there that night. Trump was elected down. like three months after you start. School. Yeah, like those three months before the election were one thing. the The following time at Georgetown was a completely different thing. Like, wow, one hundred. Talk about that. Very much so. I mean, um, I mean, it was pretty much a bygone conclusion. Like Hillary was going to win. There was no question at all. Like polls all showed that. And um, I remember being in front of the White House that night, probably around two a.m. And I just thought, I was like, I cannot believe that that just happened. Like, I think I was just like a collective shock Dude, came I over everybody. Was so shook. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, this is TV. Um, <laughs> I thought I legit thought it was a it's it was a, a joke. Like, it was like. Something we were all going to wake up from when it, when it was happening, um, but uh, it just every everything changed after that. I mean, we talked about politics in my biology class the next day. Mm-hmm. We didn't yeah. we didn't even touch. I was a pre med at the time. We didn't even touch. We didn't do a lab that week. Like it was it was a yeah. moving like that tectonically shifted the city. I think, um, but it, it just it became a really vitriolic freshman year. I think you know just what a great word. Wow. Yeah. It was, hey, it was <laughs> um, but it was a, it was such a, it, it just, it, it made me even more homesick because it, it was just like the first couple months were great. And then it was like, everything changed when the politics invaded everything. And it was like, this is it was almost like the pandemic. Like you mm-hmm. cannot escape what is happening. Can't right escape now, right? It permeates constant. everything. Yeah. It's just, everything's hostile and mm-hmm. you're it's a constant reminder of how unstable everything is. Yeah. You know? And then fast forward to the, the spring semester, I mean, we had, I think, three multi-million person marches in Washington, D.C., the Women's March being, I think there was, what, three million people there, something right. like that? Um, and just, I think, a level of political activism that we haven't seen since the 60s, I mm-hmm. think. Or even today, man. I mean, yeah, just I'd agree. recently, uh, they're, they've never had um, simultaneous um, protests in all 50 states in the history of the U.S. before, mm-hmm. right? That happened after the George Floyd murder. So yeah, it's it was a uh, it was. I mean, I, I remember coming home from school that year and being like, "What did I just experience?" Like, 
Yeah. Like I thought I wanted to study politics and then I thought, what on earth just happened? So I think that's what kind of motivated the shift more towards the foreign policy area because mm -hmm. it tends to be less partisan. The military is involved, which is not partisan. Intelligence community is involved, not partisan. And people who just kind of serve the president, they don't care what, what badge he or she wears, if blue or red. And I liked that aspect of it a lot more. Um, and it seemed more kind of long-term strategically focused than when the next election or the next sure. vote in the Senate floor or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was a that was a really moving time. I mean, I I remember telling all my friends, like, dude, we're gonna be able to say that we were here in the Trump years when everything Not, just yeah. went from pretty much like going down a straight lane here. You, it was pretty predictable establishment politics, mm -hmm. and then it was like reality TV. You just couldn't keep up with the news anymore. Like it was or it was, his Twitter account. Yeah, yeah, very it's like, much. Like, when so. did we ever have a president with a Twitter account? Yeah. You Never. know what I mean? Like, what? it's just crazy. What I will say that is interesting about Georgetown is that that spring I was taking a U.S. politics class, and part of my requirement was you had to go to a political event each week. Mm -hmm. And Georgetown sponsors speakers to come in and either give speeches or just sit down in an area like this and just do a, a round hall discussion. Mm -hmm. So I saw um, Bill Clinton speak. I saw David Litt speak, who I uh, believe is one of Obama's speechwriters. I saw, oh, I forget his name, but he's a really moderate Democrat from uh, Pennsylvania who voted against the ACA. He's been pretty active about why he voted against it. Um, Ronna Romney McDaniel is the chairwoman of the RNC was there. Nick Mulvaney was there. And it's interesting to actually just hear from people who have been in those conversations in those rooms. Yeah. Right. Because you start to understand that there are people at some point in this whole system here. At some point, it is Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer just speaking to one. It's still people. Yeah, know? it's not an event. It's just a conversation. Yeah, it's, it's still, you know, that's still a part of it, you know. It makes um, history, but for them, it's just their life. That's work, yeah. Yeah. But um, to hear from people who have been in public service in the government, and the biggest message I would get is, Despite all of what's going on right now, it's still an honorable thing to serve this country. Like, whether it, it's got problems, we can all acknowledge that. Sure. But it's, it's by no means is it not worth saving now. You know, or helping build. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. whatever you feel would better this place, actively striving to do that. You know. Yeah. I mean, every single speech or conversation would end with, so you know, kind of a Q and A, and someone would ask, you know, if I get a choice between going down the corporate route and going to you know, into the State Department or uh, you know, Labor Department, why should I go labor or state, you know? Mm -hmm. And they would say, because it's still an honorable thing and we need you to do this. Like, we, we need yeah. bright people to push us forward here. There needs right. to be an engine driving this machine. Uh, right, very much so. We were talking about this on our hike yesterday and I was hoping you could um, detail it a little more. You said um, your, your end goal is to try and get involved in U.S. intelligence, right? right? And you were just kind of skimming over the surface of like what initially, you know, got you thinking in that space, but I was hoping you could detail a little better, like what got you inspired to do that um, and maybe what your potential plans are. Yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. Um, one of the things that I, I, I like to think back on is when I was doing the research for this book, I came across um, our, I guess now former Secretary of Defense, but uh, Marine General Jim Mattis, and mm. he was someone who, you know, I kind of heard his story, and I was, one, just admiring just the awe of what this man's done, you know? But um, one thing he always talks about is just history will teach you a lot. You know, we've lived in, fighting, and dying, winning and losing on this earth for 5,000 years. The notion that you're going to find a problem that hasn't come up before, or that someone else hasn't solved before, mm -hmm. is next to nothing. All right. So pick up a history book. Um, you know, Charlie Munger is famous for saying that uh, there are answers worth billions of dollars in a $30 history textbook, mm -hmm. you know? And so I started to read more and more about, you know, the foreign policy area and what that whole sort of establishment looks like and the goals and whatnot. And one thing that he talks about, Jim Mattis, is learning from history, but also the importance of intelligence, you know, and how much of an edge that can give us diplomatically, mm -hmm. um, not only in terms of, of Foes, but also with our allies as well. It's a it's a huge area where you can build consensus and uh, and um, you know teamwork. But um, I had a professor in my senior year who uh, it was funny. She uh, she was teaching. It's an international law course, and the job I ended up signing. I came back from that interview from Boston, 
And I said, I, I asked her after class the next day, I was like, no, I just had this interview. It went really poorly. I don't know if I want to do this, but intelligence sounds really cool. And it sounds like where our foreign policy is kind of going and we're going to need to be more aware of, of what's going on. Um, and she said, I think, I think that's along the same route. Let's, let's have a chat and, um, put together some, some applications and whatnot. I never sent anything off just because I, I had signed something, but, um, it's still something where I think, you know, one, it's intellectual. I mean, you're having to, I think, make assessments of, um, uh, reward and risk based on not a lot of information. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in service of the country. You know, we're, we're trying to keep this thing safe from a lot of bad things out there. And, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, it's, it's a really, really impressive, Thing to do, I think. Um, it's incredible. I just watched this movie called Midway, uh, which is largely an intelligence battle. Mm -hmm. Very so much so. Basically, we knew that the battle of Midway. Yeah, mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor, you know, we were engaged in this conflict, and it was basically we were screwed. We had gotten a bunch of our fleet wiped out. Not all of it. They in could the have. Pacific, they could have been, talking about. Yeah, in the Pacific, they could have been way more destructive. Yeah. Had they been a little more intelligent with where they bombed us. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, we had a big disadvantage. One, our ships weren't as fast as the Japanese ships weren't as uh, good. And we had less number of them. So basically, it came down to we need to find out where they're going to go next. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, it became this intelligence battle where this intelligence officer, you know, pieced together through random snippets of radio connections they had, you know, stolen off of Japanese frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, and... They were then be able. They were. They were then able to send like a decoy fleet and then ambush them yeah. in the Battle of Midway. Mm -hmm. And it's just so crazy that all of that really came down to one guy's like broken intelligence mm -hmm. and a kind of a bet. You know what I mean? But wow. he'd been right enough before. So that's just yeah. Um, intelligence thing, is a crazy game. One thing I wanted you to touch a little bit more on that uh, you told me that was super cool and super um, eye opening in terms of how you can educate yourself. Um, Hunter informed me yesterday on our hike that, you know, they have these reading lists. Um, the U.S. Three different U.S. intelligence agencies have three separate reading lists that they kind of require for any agent that wants to be an expert in a certain region of like 15 to 30 novels that you have to read that get, basically will get you like the cultural. Um, That's so cool. The cultural understanding that you need. And they're like first person narratives from, you know, thousands of years before that can basically nurture your understanding yeah. of, of like what where their conflict is at today yeah. Yeah. um and you know you mind telling us if you've been delving into those reading lists or in spring specific regions or you know if you have any s specific passions um in terms of you know what you might want to delve into yeah absolutely like it's, a good, it's a good question and maybe too. even talk about the more details of like the agencies of the list and stuff like that yeah um so especially when the quarantine happened and I had more time to read, I asked my professors, you know, is there stuff that you recommend I read? I've, I've got plenty of time now. Um, but I just, when that article came out about Jim Madison's reading habits, it seemed to me just so impressive. Here's a guy with four stars on his uniform mm -hmm. who at each different assignment would take his library with him. Mm -hmm. And he can, he'll, he talks in quotes. Um, he just, he can always refer to you to Hey, this has happened before in history. This is something that we've seen before. Um, and uh, I just, I love that kind of reliance on history when, as he says, the cost of incompetence in, you know, foreign policy and military is, is lives, lives, essentially. You know, I mean, this is, this isn't a joke. At mm -hmm. some point, you know, if this, if the shooting starts, this comes down to lives. And, you know, we, you don't want to sign an extra Kim letter knowing that you could have been more prepared or understood a situation better. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've just, those reading lists, that, there's one that he has, and then I just started looking through more of these, and it turns out that the, the U.S. Army has one uh, that the Chief of Staff puts out every year. Uh, the U.S. Special Operations Command has one that comes out, I think, every year. Um, I believe the CIA has one. So yeah, the CIA has one. Um, but one the one that I've always just wanted to, to understand is, is just more like the history side of it, more than the sort of, I guess, contemporary issues or perspectives, but um, like I just read a book on uh, on Iran-US relations, and I didn't realize how far back we go with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how long a team of our history was, but um, kind of understanding the historical trends that drive the sort of um, conflicts that we see today, I've always been more interested in reading those. Mm -hmm. um, 
but my professors have sent me other ones that I, I like to pick books off of. But um, I just, seeing someone so accomplished because they've read and they've tried to uh, develop themselves, I think is very, it's really interesting. Right. It's a, there's an interesting story actually. So John Kelly, who uh, is another Marine general who served in administration, um, at each different promotion he got, he'd read the exact same book. And it's called The General by, um, oh, what's his name? I'll, I'll, I'll get it and put it in the comments or mm -hmm. something, but uh, it's about this World War I general who, basically speaking, just doesn't develop himself. He gets promoted by accident by superiors dying in, in battle, and he's suddenly commanding a, a division in World War I. And he never stops to think, Am I prepared? Am I ready? Why am I here? Am yeah. I thinking strategically? Is there is is are the orders I'm giving are they actually driven by a strategy and and uh, you know backing of, right. of the whole or by or, like ego or you know anything like that? Yeah. False confidence. Yeah. False confidence. Very much so. And um, he he puts a lot of stock in the wrong qualities. You know the the desire to you know face the enemy and and die Body in battle. Count. Yeah. But it's not it's not bravery. A, yeah. 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 It's it's dumb blind bravery. It's not right. yeah. am I trans warfare, bro. It's, it's like social. notoriously the worst kind of war warfare. Yeah. yeah. And so to so General Kelly always reads this book at every promotion to think to back back to myself, am I really developing the skills yeah. I need for this? You know just to check. Just to remind just, himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd check out those reading lists for sure. I found some really cool stuff on That's there. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that existed. That's such Talk a, about yeah, such like a need. wanting to be yeah. an expert in any field, and you can go straight to the source because people that need to be experts need to read those reading lists. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great way if you're trying to develop your understanding of how we got to this shit show of 2020. Or just trying to learn how to read in general. Yeah. <laughs> so. But um, yeah, I mean, I think especially now with like you said earlier with the. With the pandemic happening, we're all at home. You know, what are we going to come out of this with? Mm -hmm. You know, are we going to just kind of let the time pass, or are we going to yeah. find something to develop ourselves? Well, you've you know? improved yourself with this, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. Speaking of coming out of the pandemic, we're going to make a, a big transition away from politics and towards something a little more, a little bit more lighthearted, um, because sports just came back. Thank God. Two days oh, ago. goodness gracious. The Dodgers are 2 0. Well, sports came back a while ago, but if you're a Dodger fan like I us, was gonna say, it's two days ago. For yeah. us, we for us it's been a long, long, long drought of watching our favorite teams. Of watching us spend a ton of money. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations <laughs> to Mookie Betts. Acquire some in incredible talents and then wonder are we never going to see Mookie Betts play as a Dodger? Seriously. <laughs> yeah. We were really worried about that, uh, but luckily we got that settled. We don't know about David Price. But um, I, thought nice it'd be interesting. Baseball. Yeah. I thought it'd be interesting to just to backtrack to, you know, maybe you guys can recount like you're just the the onset of boredom that came after oh. like the big three sports were officially canceled. And honestly, like the the pandemic, we mentioned this in episode one, the pandemic didn't even seem like much as much of a reality until sports got canceled and we had literally nothing to do. Yeah. Well, it was tough because I kind of got a rude awakening of how much of my life revolved around sports. <laughs> so rude. Because like, oh at first God. I was like, yeah, I watched the games, you know, but it's like, it doesn't end there. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, all the podcasts, all the radio shows I listen to, terrible. Terrible. No content. And you can tell these guys are bored out of their minds yeah. just producing yeah. nonsense, you know, and yeah. not to mention just, you know, like the fun of like, you know, like betting on games with your buddies and just like. Talking, you know, like crap with your buddies about like a game. Like I miss that. I miss that. You know so what I mean? Much, yeah. It's like it's a, for me that was it was integral to a lot of my relationships with people. You know, where we would just talk about baseball game. You know what I mean? Or like, mm -hmm. you know, Bam's a, a Nats fan. He gets to taunt me, you know, for a whole year oh. after the Nats win. Or anyone who's an Astros fan, I get to tell them that you know they should. You know, shooting yeah. out World Series, Houston Astros. Don't get me started. So, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Luke. Goodness. My, my roommate's an Astros We're talking fan. talking about we'll Fruity here. About yeah, we've all got one. Everyone's got an Astros fan. We put up with them. Um, but it's just, I got this rude awakening of how much my life actually revolves around yeah, these dude. teams. Whether it be just how I spend my time or the people I talk with. It's just, it's like, maybe I need to become a more dynamic individual. Seriously. But it, just, it, it brings me a ton of joy. So really much does. joy. We've, we've so much enjoyed being able to watch the Dodgers and Lakers play oh. again. Uh, Alex Caruso fouled out today. He went off. 
He went off. Well, yeah, yeah, they did him dirty. That wasn't a foul. Not to mention, it wasn't a foul. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just so reinvigorating for everybody's spirit. I can imagine so to have um, baseball and basketball back, and hopefully the NFL can figure out their yeah. Their also, just history. to return to normal, you know, yeah. to at least the semblance of normalness. It's just it's weird right. to look in the stands and see cardboard cutouts oh, okay. or just piped in noise. Yeah. Another thing, I'm starting to realize how much they were piping in noise before the pandemic. Yeah. Because right. the games sound identical over That's broadcast. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, heart goes out to these guys that are putting themselves out, you know, in more risk than they were before. Uh, and also, just like, it's got to be weird not playing in front of a fan stadium. Yeah, not fans. playing in front of fans. An empty Dodger stadium that's oh. meant to, you know, hold 100,000 people. I don't know. And yeah. honestly, for me, that, it, like, this is going to be a very selfish bit for a second, but uh, part of the part of the, the best part about living in LA is being able to like enjoy Dodger Stadium. It's like oh. something that's an extremely unique LA experience. Like whenever I whenever I have friends in town, um, that's like one of the major things that they have to do by the time they leave is go to a Dodger game. Take them to Manny Wood. Yeah. yeah, because get some freaking Mitchell Dodge Dogs Dodgers. and you know. Clamados in the in the outfield Freaking are awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's it Chavez is. Ravine, there's yeah. nothing like it. So it's just it's been a bummer to not be able to um, you know enjoy you know our, our favorite our love for baseball and our yeah. love for our city. But um, we're glad to see that things are back on track enough that that they can be playing. You know, oh, one last thing. Someone tell Pablo Sandoval how a mask works. <laughs> Dude. This guy's wearing a mask under his chin. I'm like, bro. Oh, like, Sandoval, yeah. wearing a mask you? under his chin. <laughs> it's like, what like, Come on, like? dude. Yeah, he also yeeted Chris Taylor with his fat dude. ass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Check that out. On Mars. <laughs> Taylor's still in orbit, dude. Oh, God. Oh, oh, God. Sorry, what are you going to say? You know what? My favorite documentary, I figured it out. I got it. I okay. Got it. Oh, okay. All right. We get, here it goes. Transitioning. Everybody. Oh, just, you want to do more sports, though? No, I don't. we're good. Well, we can let's try and do sports. What's up, Docs, this week? So, okay. Sports. Every, what's up, Docs? Oh, I got to pivot. Uh, yeah, do a pivot while we, while we label ours. So, everybody who's watched episode one and two know that we love Looney Tunes and we love documentaries. So, the what's up, Doc, for episode three, Hunter's going to give his recommendation. There's a documentary on Dodger Stadium I watched last week. Okay, it was awesome. I mean, I, I didn't realize this before, but. And when the Dodgers moved out from, from New York, mm -hmm. they brought the Giants with them. There was no stadium in LA. They had to kind of... They played at the Coliseum. I like the way you said that. We did bring the Giants with them. Yeah. With it was a two-team deal. Yeah. They were very yeah. lucky to join us. Well, because it makes sense. Cause, I mean, you, you can't fly across the country just for one you know, game and go back. But um, the the owners, the owner at the time... What was it? I forget his name. But in any case... No, that was a GM. Who, Michigan guy, by the way. Uh, yeah, I know who he is. Um, I'm blanking. But, but uh, it wasn't O'Malley, was it? No. I don't think it was O'Malley yet. O'Malley's the guy who bought, like, who was the most recent guy before. Okay. But in any case, the owner, the idea, so the, you know, the idea of the West Coast, you know, this was, when was this? 1957, is that right? Yeah, it was 1958 was the first season. Of the LA. Okay. So the whole like, West Coast population, it kind of boomed after World War II. A lot of the, mm -hmm. the, well, the railroad, kind of, yeah. Right, all, all of that kind of you know, blossomed out there. And the idea was the stadium was going to be a bit of modernity. It was supposed to not look like the old kind of brick and mortar. Yeah. Fenway. You know, yeah, like Fenway or, you know, good ballpark. But um, like Ebbets Field was kind of an old. And, and yeah, it was an institutional. Yeah, place, it was, it was made out of brick. You yeah. know, it looked like a it looked like um, like a training station almost when mm -hmm. you walked in there. Mm -hmm. But you walk into Dodger Stadium, it's, Chavez, baby. Yeah, it's it's kind of in this weird spot in LA, right? It's in the it's in the ravine. That's a park. Yeah, yeah. yeah. northeast of downtown. Like it's not exactly a prime location because they built it into the side of that hill there, right? In terraces, and they just blasted out a lot of rock and stuff, and. You can drive in on any level, as, as you guys know, haven't been there. But the idea was it was the beginning of the new era of baseball. Yeah. Kind of these really cool, totally swept seen in design, rooms, yeah. minimalist. You know, I mean, beautiful weather all the time. Yeah. The weather sucked on the East Coast for baseball right. Right. many months of the year. Always, always uh, warm out, you know. And um, there was really cool, swept, 
you know, rooms that kind of mimic the cars of the day. It was, yeah. uh, it was kind of the new sexy. Reminds me like a Mad Men right. kind of style. Yeah, I mean, and, minimalist. And the Dodgers won the World Series the next year. You know, and it was kind of like, wow, this is something cool. This is really something yeah. new and special. Mm -hmm. And the documentary was all about that. It was really cool. What's the documentary called? It was on Dodger and the Dodger Channel. I, uh, that'll be hard to find. <laughs> but if I if I find I'll find it when we're done. There's we'll, a documentary we'll on Dodger Stadium. Stadium. Watch it. Sports right, just, just came go, back. Just we're getting selfish. We're doing Dodger right. stuff. Just go to Dodger Stadium. Watch Actually, um, just in terms of old ballparks, um, I was curious when I was in high school one time, and I looked up like ballparks in in age, right? Mm -hmm. And since the Yankee Stadium had just been recently re redone, um, they kind of had to go to the bottom of the list. So, if you've been to Fenway, Wrigley, which is where the Cubs play in Chicago, Dodger Stadium is number three, and Angel, really? Angel Stadium is number four, which is wow, Ugh. right? The and Angel guy. Stadium it looks like trash, but it's like looks like trash, full but trash, like just, just, trash. just having been to those four ballparks, those trash are all baseball, the just dude, the Angels are the worst. Yeah, don't hate on Mike Trout. The Los Angeles Angels of the Anaheim. Yeah. Hey, quick geography lesson for anyone listening not from LA. Yeah. Not the same thing. Yeah, Anaheim is like over an hour south. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, moving on to what's up, Doc number two. Um, I'm going to recommend a really cool one on Netflix that came out probably a year ago or two. Um, that's called Icarus. Um, and a little bit of backstory about the, the documentary. It's about a guy who was basically fascinated by doping in cycling and was an American documentary guy. And he basically partnered with a Russian doctor who is the head of the anti-doping lab in Moscow, which is like the most famous anti-doping lab in Moscow. Because they're not and, very good at their job. Um, and <laughs> the, the crazy part is like, by making this documentary is how they found out that there is an institutional doping problem in Russia. And if you recall, in 2012, in the London Olympics, Russia wasn't even allowed to be represented there. It was like the people of... Um, oh, the People's Republic of Russia or something. It was like not... It was, it was, it was like the, the word NPR. Russia wasn't in... They didn't have the Russian flag on it either. It was just like a blank red It was just thing. a random group of athletes that got to... Color I don't know what they, what they called, but everybody remembers that Russia wasn't represented in the 2012 Olympics. And this, this specific documentary, like as they were actively making it, the guy was like getting, getting death threats from um, different uh, leaders in the Russian government and had to come back, like seek asylum in the US, the, the, Ew, the Russian guy. Frightening. Um, so basically, it's, it's really hilarious because the guy's trying to beat um, any standard doping tests in cycling. Well, they were doing right? it very well. And the guy who's in charge of the doping testing is the guy who's giving him the doping program that yeah. will pass all the tests that he's doing. So well, it's it was super more than a cyclist too, a gymnast. He was like fraught all throughout the Russian like yeah. athletics. Yeah, and there was that swim the the Russian swimmer that like Katie Ledecky absolutely smoked that that <laughs> that was caught cheating as well. Free smoke. Shout out to Katie Ledecky. Katie Ledecky was still dry by the time that other girl finished. Yeah. Oh my god, she's dude. a beast. That that oh. visual of Katie Ledecky being like a, a full lap <laughs> past the record. <laughs> Everybody remembers that dude, um, and then she turned down like a like like a fifty million dollar deal from like Speedo or some swim gear company to go back to school. Really, you know, respect for her. Man. She's on that new uh, that new documentary that LeBron is doing on Apple TV um, called like Legends or something. But uh, yeah, definitely watch Icarus. It's a kick ass documentary and really really eye opening for um, the corruption of of doping in sports. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a what's up, Doc? You can just go back to what you're doing. Dude, I couldn't come up with a sports doc in time. So my what's up, Doc, is going to be a docu-series. It's Long Strange Trip. It's about the Grateful Dead. Um, just basically details, one, what a bizarre environment and climate, like political climate, they, yeah. I'll still, please don't, uh, <laughs> that they like kind of came to be famous in. It's like 1960 San Francisco. In the middle of like a big beat hippie movement, like right. the beat generation, Jack Kerouac, right. those guys, mm -hmm. and like the weird tail end of the hippie mm -hmm. movement, kind of where they got their feet and how they kind of created themselves, mm -hmm. um, and then follows their journey for the next thirty years of being just wow. rock power. So they actually movement. have like footage of them on tour and stuff. Oh, they have footage of them playing their first concert together. Wow, as like fifteen-year-old kids. 
That's so cool, dude. And they're all from San Francisco. They're all from San Francisco, all just people from the neighborhood yeah. that kind of just got caught pretty... up in this cultural revolution. Mm-hmm. And what's the craziest thing is, though, it's like they have this little magical moment of time where they start making this music. Mm-hmm. And then they're famous for the next 30 years and right. only get kind of more and more famous. Right. Mm-hmm. And the only cool part is, no crowds. Grateful Dead show, have, is they've never played the, sh- the same sh- show twice. It's impossible so, because it's just so much of it's improv. Yeah. Well, no. The point is that their set list is like their 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 base of music is so vast that they yeah. never have the same set list. And you could see every the, the reason they do that is because people literally like they tour the every, they tour yeah. every summer for like three months. And there are people that literally spend their whole summer following the dead on their on their mm-hmm. tour because all every show is different. Wow. And it's really interesting to hear from like it's all really covering the band especially because. It's interesting to hear their take on their musical career because a lot of them are like, when we started off, we were in this magical music making moment Mm -hmm. where we were so creative and so driven. And then we, of course, get the effects of just like being on the road and partying as hard as they did, to be honest. Right. Where it's like, they need to take a step back. But then it's also like, if you've been doing music, making music for 30 years, it's tough to find that magic again. You know what I mean? Where you're just like, well, it's crazy that they still have that magic going even after their essential piece in their band, Jerry Garcia, has been dead for 10 plus years now. I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, half the band is uh-huh. other people, like Oto Bridges and, you know, John Mayer. What yeah. I can what I can appreciate is how their their sound and their vibe still is is still somewhat intact with the Dead Company band with John Mayer. Like I was lucky enough to see them a couple summers ago at the Hollywood Bowl. And I was absolutely blown away by John Mayer's talent, like the way that he meshes with them. And, you know, he has a very similar voice to Jerry G as well. Yeah, well, you know, you've got two things. One, it's like the reason you'll never catch the same Grateful Dead concert is because even if it's the exact same set list, it will never be remotely the same concert. Right. Because they improv and they just go off and they go in and out of songs and then back into new songs, you know what I mean? Mm. And they're really more playing off of each other than they are playing a set list. They're just kind of all very, very intelligent, capable musicians and just kind of letting each other guide each other through the thing. And as an audience, you're like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is the coolest musical experience. So I'm a, I'm a big Grateful Dead fan though. So I do recommend yeah. that if you're we honestly both, just like rock and roll or Grateful Dead or any of we're that. We're both uh, huge Dead fans. Um, I, it, was, it was hilarious. I went to go play a round of golf with my youngest brother, Chooch. Shout out to Chooch. Um, we played a, Chooch a course in Ventura. <laughs> Um, which is notorious for like it's kind of like a an older community where people kind of from the LA area generally either go north or south to retire. Um, we're playing with these old dudes um, that um, like on the second hole are like, "Oh, you guys cool? We listen to music." And we're like, "Yeah, no problem." And they're like, "Yeah, we just always listen to Dead when we play." Awesome, and, oh, man. <laughs> That's they so were cool. just blasting Dead on the course the whole time, and you know it was just such a vibe, dude. Respect. All right, real quick, favorite Dead songs go. Jeez, uh, Touch of Grey for sure, um, Slipknot, and uh, Help on the Way as well was, was so sick. Okay. Gonna be honest, I didn't know about the Grateful Dead until probably late last year. Okay. But I will say I found, I was I like John Mayer a lot, and I found the Dead & Company band. Mm-hmm. I thought it was awesome. Now, forgive me, I don't, is, is Althea one of their songs? Or yes, Althea is a Grateful Dead song. That is a great, okay, so I love, that's my, that's. Althea is mm-hmm. awesome, yeah, yeah. That. phenomenal song. I don't know if that was a cover, that's actually their song, but yes, that was, that's an awesome song. What about you, sweet? Um, Stella Blue, I did name my dog after that song. Stella Blue is, is, yep. Is the yeah, dang that. here. Uh, so that is probably my favorite song. I also uh-huh. love. Addicts of My Life is good. Yeah. We were um, also listening to uh, Fire on the Mountain. We should say this because we, we were immediately yeah. to give this lady a shout out. This oh, lady, yeah. Oh, this lady yes. is great. This yes. lady made our day yesterday, okay? So we're at this, we're at this um, or two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. We're at this hike at the base of the Canyon Canyon Resort. Um, Gorgeous. City, yeah, right at the so base of the mountain. And uh, we're playing some dead. And this lady uh, uh, is like right behind us. And she's like, you kids are so cool. Like, you know, yeah. she's like, she's how like, do you have this you guys have the coolest, You guys have the coolest parents. I love the day. And that she just made our day, bro. And she, yeah. wants, she was purposely like going for, like further than us. And then like we saw her at four separate times because she was trying to stay within the ear's distance. And yeah. she was really digging our, our body. The sweetest so. lady, just happy, would dance and just like very welcoming. 
honestly kind of going back to where we started, just like kind of that Utah hospitality. That, that Utah yeah. spirit. For Very some friendly, reason, open. Everybody open, has been happy. so nice to us, man. It's, it's hard to be unhappy here. I mean, this yeah. is a pretty stunning Look place. Look at this freaking deal yeah. we got here. I, uh, the, the Utah thing is just, it's so, it's so palpable. Like, a best example I can give is, so in, in Los Angeles, you, you have a DMV there, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. You, just, you may as well just write the oh, day. Dude, just write the you day. You us all cringe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, if that's a Tuesday, just tell your tell yeah. your significant other, I'll see you tomorrow, honey. Like, yeah. Schedule your therapist appointment it, it for the day. To talk it about the abuse, the abuse you endured yeah. at the DMV. Oh, so, I mean, God bless them. Show the nice folks. It's just a really inefficient place. But we, <laughs> we go to the one here in, in Salt Lake, and I don't think I've ever been treated better. Hi, how are you today? How do you take your coffee? How are things going? <laughs> how you so take your coffee? What can I, we do for you guys? In LA, like, are you trying to take me out? Are you trying yeah. to kill me? What's in this coffee, you know, man? Like, what, what can we do for you guys? Turns out there was a problem getting the license. She's like, oh, that's okay. I'll just give them a call right now and we'll figure it out. I'm like, I have never had a DMV employee yeah. make a phone call on my behalf to another department to get something done. Like, what else? Wow. Anything else we can do for you today? You know, I'm just like, what? Unbelievable. I've never seen someone be that friendly, mm -hmm. you know, in and, and that situation. But, um, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, that's the best example. I've had, a, I've had a huge affinity for Park City. Um, my family grew up going to Mammoth Mountain um, for, you know, we would always have ski week in California. Because, you know, <laughs> random week in February where you get the week off and go to Mammoth. And then um, one of our friends, family friends, um, convinced us to go up with them to Park City one year because... They're, they're Mormons and they, they have a house up here too. Um, and we just loved it and we never turned back. And uh, actually like two very, very close uh, friends and family at the same time, my cousins Spencer and Isaiah um, are from the Midwest and both moved out here to go to college and haven't left. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were actually trying to get them on, we'll get them on soon enough. Um, we were trying to be able to do an episode with them at some point uh, because they've been living um, a super you know, interesting a, a, life. <laughs> a fairy tale, out, like outdoorsy, um, active, um, fun life out here. And I just attribute that to, you know, the willing, willingness of people to, you know, be away from like, you know, a major city and like stepping away from status um, of, of any sort yeah. and just truly like living the life that you want by being in the mountains. Yeah. Like no, one, no, one, here, time doing, no yeah. one here is, thinks they're, thinks they're big, bigger than anybody else. Um, everybody here is here for the same same reasons to be you know one with nature, be outdoors, play golf, go fishing, go yeah. hiking, go skiing in the winter time, and you know it's just super refreshing to get to spend some time up here, man. Thank you a lot for yeah. inviting us. Yeah, of course, yeah. I uh, my dad talked about this all the time. You know that this is here such that we can have people up here and have fun, and you know um, it's just it's uh, like you said, it's a really nice thing to get out here and kind of. Um, Live out the kind of life you want, you know, like what you mm -hmm. talked about. Be out in the mountains, be hiking, be playing golf, fishing, yeah, cooking some good steaks out back, you know. I think it's uh it's 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 really important in terms of like just the balance of of the pace of your life, like especially with when we're heading like when our furloughs eventually end and we're heading into the workforce, we're gonna be head down grinding. Yeah. Because we've had so much time off. Like the guy I was interviewing for a job the other day and the guy was like, Oh, we get like four weeks PTO and I was like, wait, like Who's gonna be taking PTO like yeah. after yeah. after this like six month? That gun goes off and I'm sprinting. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we're we're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah. Now, you know, like we're all really itching to, to you know pr prove ourselves in, in the in the job job market. Right? Yeah, totally, totally. And, um, but in terms of living a fast paced life in LA and having this house in Park City and getting to decompress um, maybe once a quarter, um, it just seems like perfect. You know, in order mm -hmm. to maintain your zen. So yeah. that's awesome. No doubt. No doubt. Well, thank you guys for joining us. I hope you enjoyed hearing a bit about Hunter's journey and kind of what is so special about him and why we love Hunter so much. Uh, and getting to watch Stella Blue Sins for probably an hour and some change. <laughs> yeah, Stella so. was very behaved. And thank you guys again for watching this episode three of Loading with Will and Finn featuring Hunter Tiedemann. That was fantastic. We have some bowling and lounging by Cabana. We've got some floating to attend to. Uh, and, yes. uh, we got a weekend to finish off. So yeah. thank you guys for watching. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll check in with you guys next week. All right. Thanks for having me.